Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if female Deku married Shigaraki part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 3rd comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Mama Donovan from Out 3. So let's start the video since this task was going to take a lot of planning. The students came together in a huddle to think of some kind of strategy. Kazuko squeezed in between Kami and Ida while Bakugo unsurprisingly got the first word in. Because the teacher didn't fulfill her role as the leader was looked down on, the brats ended up taking over. He told the group, Agreed, these children have no respect for authority, so of course chaos would reign. Ada added with a stiff movement of his arm. But if these kids are just like that, then what are we supposed to do about it? Kami asked, Just wait for them to grow out of it. They aren't just like that. This didn't happen for no reason. There's definitely a boss who's creating this atmosphere. So find that kid. Bakugo said. Ah, a ringleader. Excellent idea. Ida said. Izuko hid her smile. She always knew Kakin was smart, but this idea probably came from personal experience. When they were kids, Kakin was the boss, and they were all a part of the agency Bakugo, following his every order. Then Ida asked. What will we do once we find this miniature mastermind? We string him up and beat him up to make an example of him and make the other kids throw rocks at him. Bakugo said intensely, Kakin, that's a terrible idea. Izuko pressed her hands to her cheeks in embarrassment. Of course his good moments had to be followed by his bad ones. What? It'll be the most effective way to make him realize just how insignificant he really is. Bakugo said, marching out to carry out his plan. Whoever's the strongest, come out. Fight me. Even after ten years, Kakin was the same as he'd always been. He didn't care how old these kids were, he was prepared to pound them silly. Such an outdated, violent way of thinking. You're giving yourself away. One little boy said coyly. Kazuko looked at him, and he reminded her of a younger Monoma from Class 1B, with his pompous attitude. So Kakin was right about there being a boss, but this kid appeared to work through wit instead of brute strength. He may have been a child, but it still gave Izuko the chills. Enough already, just come out. Bakugo continued. Delinquents aren't fashionable, you know. Kami commented on his behavior. Then make it fashionable. Bakugo yelled. Once he was riled up like this, there was no telling what was going to come out of his mouth. Perhaps instead of asserting our authority as their elders, we should first try to earn their respect as equal. Ada suggested, we are all still students, after all. And how do students come to respect one another? Through studies and schoolyard games. That's it. Ada stood in the middle of the ruckus and announced loudly, attention, children. It's now time for a game of Simon Says. The boss kid rolled his eyes, but other children joined in at the idea of a game. Izuko stood and Kami stood on each side of Ida to play along as well. Simon says, put your hands behind your back. Ida instructed, and the kids followed along. Good. Now Simon says, stand on one leg. He said, and they did so. He kept going with a few simple motions like raising their hands and touching their toes. Now shout out your favorite hero. Ida demanded. Bunny hero Mirko. The girl with flowers in her hair yelled out. Mount lady. A little boy shouted. Out and out. You're both out. Ada responded, chopping his arm towards them. Simon didn't say to do that. Yes, you did. You're Simon. The kids argued. Correct. But I did not say Simon says. Therefore you weren't supposed to perform that action. Ada clarified. No fair. That's cheating. The girl shouted. It's most certainly not. Those are the rules of the game. Ada countered. Now Simon says jump in the air. Huh. Another kid leaped on Ada's back and hooked his arms around his neck. Ack, release me. Ada exclaimed. Anna, you didn't say Simon says. The kid retorted. All the kids followed suit by jumping up in the air and dogpiling on Ada until he could barely get a word out over all the ruckus. He crawled out from under all the small squirming bodies and barely croaked out. Simon says, help me. Izuko and Kami dug into the pile and pulled him out by each arm. As all the kids crawled off, their attention was once again lost and they moved on to the next thing. Oh ho ho, looks like Tenya Ida gave it the old college tribe but to no avail. If anything, the kids are even rowdier than ever. Present Mike commented to the auditorium. Ah, of course it didn't work. I'm telling you, a little violence is necess. Bakugo said, but was caught off guard when he watched Izuko keep her hold on Ida's arm. It's okay, Ida. I thought it was a good effort. Izuko rubbed the shoulder padding of Ida's armor as she looked at him gently. Ida felt her touch and immediately stiffened. He slowly shifted his head to see her eyes looking right at him with her hands still on him. That gaze made the muscles under his suit quiver, and his face flushed in redness. Bakugo also turned red, in fury. She seemed mad at them earlier, but now she was back to her encouraging self, her assuring gestures included. You ah, uh, thank you, Midoriya. Biba, he'd a quickly slipped his arm out of her grip to compose himself. Our task still isn't done. 
We're no closer to winning these children's hearts. Right, but there's other things we can try. The Zuko pumped her fists in determination. Once Ida took his distance from her, Bakugo took a deep breath and shook his head. He shouldn't be getting worked up over something like that. First of all, Izuko wasn't even his girlfriend anymore. And two, Izuko was like that with all of her friends, so it didn't mean anything. And finally, the Zuko had only recently come back to her normal life. There was no way she would flirt with anyone right now. Right, like what? Bakugo asked her bitterly. You tried being all nice and buddy-buddy with them and now they respect you even less. Izuko folded her arms and pulled on her lips as she thought about it. Kakin had a point, but they couldn't go about this so violently. She tried to think back to when they were children. Were they really so different from these kids? At that age, in this society that they live in, there was one thing above all that commanded respect more than seniority and authority. Got nothing to say. Kakin told her, then we got not choice. We have to hey guys, Kami added. You all have been trying to do this normally the whole time, but wouldn't it be faster if we, like, showed them our quirks? That's right. Izuko beamed as the light bulbs went off in their heads. I was just about to say that. Bakugo exclaimed in frustration that Kami stole his thunder. No way, what a coincidence, Kami said without an ounce of malice in the slightest. So the students rounded up again to try to think of a new strategy of winning the kids over with their quirks without challenging them into an all-out brawl. But what Izuko didn't realize was that the kids before them saw the heroes differently than they did. When she and Kaken were children, pro heroes were still on unbreakable pedestals, untarnished idols that they would ever be so lucky to see with their own eyes. But even in the short time after All Might's retirement, that worship of heroes was starting to fade from this generation. Heroes were no longer untouchable. They could be torn down by anyone who had the quirk to do it. As the remedial students convened, so did the kindergartners. Their teacher, who knew them well, started to panic. Stop. It's dangerous. She cried out. That's right, we know. That we're better than you guys. A small blonde boy with sharp teeth declared as all the children started unleashing their quirks. Izuko was stunned. A kid in overalls had an actual cannon coming out of his mouth. One had floating orbs with sharp teeth, one had projectile rings of light, some had new appendages, and those were just the quirks she could see from a quick scan. Their teacher desperately warned them that these kids were convinced that they could defeat pro heroes with their own powers. And now the kids were looking for a fight to prove it. Come on, Bretz. I'll fight you. Kakan accepted their challenge willingly, but Izuko stayed back and watched carefully. One of the orbs flew past Kakan so fast that ripped his eye mask in half. How do you like my binging balls? The sharp-toothed kid boasted. You couldn't dodge it, could you? It was too fast and strong for you to see, wasn't it? And then suddenly, their vision was obscured by a smoke screen of dust. Another kid had used his assault dust quirk when they weren't looking. And then the rest of the children began to call out their quirk attacks. Viral Cosmos. Electromagnetic Bullets. King Slam. Hula Hoop. Tongue Tank. If they weren't being attacked by them right now, Izuko would have been in awe of such powerful quirks. And even though they were still young, a lot of these kids already seemed to have some kind of handle on them. Woo, kids these days are crazy strong. Present Mike commented. Izuko had to gulp. When they were kids, Kakin was the one who got the most powerful quirk in class, and even he wasn't able to use it like this. But more importantly, to her at least, having such a powerful quirk at a young age, did things to his ego that as far as she was concerned could never be remedied. It cursed their relationship, poisoning it from the very beginning. She had both enabled it and tried to stop it, since she was the one by his side for all that time. Then, she couldn't take it anymore. And now there was a whole generation of kids just like him. Izuko almost thought she would faint. Hey, what's going on? When I was that age, I couldn't produce that kind of power, physically, legally, or mentally. Present Mike said, This is what I have heard. A new voice entered the stadium, or at least entered the main floor. Seiji Shishikura, one of the observers from Shikzu, snuck down to join Present Mike in his commentary, giving representation from his school's perspective. He continued, As the generations pass, quirks mix and deepen. Those stronger, more complex quirks may one day become too hard for anyone to control. It's the quirk singularity doomsday theory. Watching these children make me fearful that it will come true. Azuko took a deep breath. She had come across that theory as well on online forums. She hadn't given it much thought until today. And when she considered Uri as well, that just gave it more weight. She looked up into the stands, directly at Shoto. He could be proof of it, too. Shoto told her himself that Endeavor made him for the sake of making a hero more powerful than himself, someone strong enough to defeat All Might. He and Dabai. Dabai. She felt his lips on hers as she thought of him. It derailed her train of thought. Another one of her more. Indecent moments with the League. But she couldn't concern herself with that now. She shook the thought out and looked away from Todoroki. The point was that Endeavor knew his offspring had the potential to be more powerful than him and he was counting on it. But as Gang Orca told them at the beginning, 
This wasn't a battle of quirks. This was a battle of hearts. She stood tall alongside her classmates as the kindergartners unleashed their quirks on them. Their powers may have caught her off guard, but she didn't let them intimidate her. Why should she? Every quirk was a blessing in her eyes. It was just a matter of how people chose to use them. They were determined to teach these kids to use their quirks for the greater good instead of their own gain. The remedial class faced the kindergartners without doubts and hesitation. Some of them, like Izuko and Bakugo, were even glad that the children finally brought their quirks out to play. It reminded them of the crazy world they lived in and how unpredictable the future was. Pretty bold of them to attack without hesitation like that. Bakugo said with a hint of pleasure, I'm almost impressed. They're firmly aware of our status as heroes in training and feel no obligation to show any restraint. Ada said, you gotta admit, their quirks are pretty amazing. Izuko said as she held her fists up defensively. No way, they're not scared of our quirks at all. Seriously, the shark-toothed boy in the front hesitated when he saw that their show of force didn't get the reaction he wanted. They think they're better than us just because they're older. The true ringleader of the kids said as he stood against the wall, watching the scene like a game of chess. That's not true. We're not necessarily better, we just have more training. But one day Izuko tried to refute that statement. Save it, Deku. They're not gonna listen to reason. Stick to the plan. Bakugo told her. Come on, everyone. Let's show him more of what we've got. The boy goaded his classmates and got them even more riled up. Leave it up to me. A brunette ponytailed girl declared as she fired a heart-shaped vector of energy from her forehead. Queen beam, shoot. When the beam hit its mark, it left a cloud of smoke that obscured the person standing there. Once it cleared, it revealed Bakugo standing in a more relaxed pose, his face cleared of his usual scowl. With twinkling eyes and a smiling expression, he gave off an uncharacteristically romantic aura. Wow, you've got such a beautiful face, dear. Don't let that frown spoil the effect. He said sweetly with his hand reaching out delicately. The little girl was hit with a feeling of infatuation. Izuko's eyes widened in absolute shock as she blushed as well. She'd never seen him like that, ever. And then with a puff of pink smoke, his form disappeared, showing that it was Kami all along. Sorry, Han. Just a little illusion for ya. Kami wagged her finger and winked. The real Bakugo was so mortified that he was frozen in place. Wouldn't it be, like, so swoony though? Kami said as she thought about it. Just as I thought. Too good to be true. Izuko muttered. As she turned away, embarrassed that she fell for it, too. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Bakugo yelled as he caught what Izuko said. Say that again, I dare you. Um, I'd rather not. Izuko didn't want to have to spell it out for him, but fortunately, or unfortunately, Ada was willing to do that for her. I think she's implying that idea of you actually behaving in a romantic fashion is so unrealistic that it could only be a fantasy, Ada said. And then to poke the bear even further, he added, which is tragic considering your previous connection as lovers. Don't say that, Izuko and Bakugo shouted in unison. No way, you two dated. Awkward, Kami responded, tapping on her chin, but I'm still like, totally jealous. My school's really old-fashioned and doesn't let us date. Perhaps that's something that UA should consider. Young love can be a beautiful thing, but it doesn't belong in the high-stakes environment of hero training. It has the potential to cloud judgment which could result in dangerous consequences. Ada asserted loudly. We're getting off topic. Focus, extras, we still gotta beat these tykes. Back Hugo said to drop the sensitive subject and get back on task. Right. I hope this works, Izuko said as she rushed over to Gang Orca to make a request. If he agreed to it, it would make their whole plan a lot easier. From the stands, Shoto sat with his hands in a steeple over his mouth. It burned him to watch them from above. He didn't envy their struggle of trying to get the children under control, but he still wanted to be able to do something. He looked over to his father, who was having a serious talk with All Might that he wasn't able to hear. Not that he cared what that old man had to say. He was probably embarrassing himself and dragging his name into it, too. When he looked away from them, he caught an Asayurashi eyeing him from the other side of the auditorium. Had he been staring at him the whole time? Watching him just reminded him of everything he'd said to him at the exam, about how his eyes reminded him of Endeavor. That struck Shoto more than Inasai could possibly know, but when he thought about it, the reason it angered him so much was because of how it was probably true. After all, his mother had thrown boiling water at him after just catching a glimpse of that eye. And then, at the entrance exam for recommended students, he wasn't exactly open to the people around him, so maybe he had been turning into his father more than he wanted to admit. But that was a different time. He'd moved on from that. After he fought her, when Izuko told him that his quirk was his and his alone, it changed his world. She just had that kind of effect on people. He didn't want to admit how jealous he was that the others got to be with her in the remedial training and he could only sit and watch. When she was gone, he promised himself that he'd tell her his feelings for her if and when he saw her again. 
But when she did return, he could see in her eyes that she was consumed in her own thoughts and worries. It made sense, considering everything she'd been through. But even he was perceptive enough to see that a love confession would have been highly inappropriate. He just wanted to see her smile again. And now she was. But she was alongside Ada and Bakugo. He'd seen the way she tenderly touched Ada's arm to comfort him when his tactics didn't work. And the way she looked at Bakugo as she approached him, like she was trying to heal the rift between them. It all just made him feel like he was being left behind. It was his own fault. Even if Inessa provoked him, it didn't justify how he acted during the exam. They targeted each other instead of focusing on their real opponent. And someone got hurt. He stared right back at Inessa, who still hadn't broken eye contact with him. Maybe he just needed to swallow his pride and talk to him. Really talk to him, even if talking to others wasn't his strong suit. Maybe if he tried to explain things, then they could clear the air between them. He kept his eyes on Inessa and stood up, watching his rival do the same. He walked along the circle of the bleachers, and Inessa did the same, until they met halfway. I noticed you were staring at me. Todoroki didn't know how to start this conversation. Is there something you want to say to me? Inessa immediately smashed his head to the floor in an intense bow. Todoroki, allow me to apologize. It's my fault we failed the exam and that we're not able to take the remedial course. Inessa said as he stood back up again and wiped the blood off of his forehead. Watching our classmates face this challenge head-on gave me a lot of time for self-reflection. I realized that I alone am responsible for my own actions and that I let my disdain for you get in the way of my true passion of being a hero. Yeah, I wanted to apologize, too. Todoroki responded, though less intensely than Inessa, and not just for the license exam. But for the entrance exam, too, I want you to know that I have no intention to be anything like my father. In reality, I actually hate him even though I respect his power as a hero. Excellent. So now that we've apologized to each other, that means we can take the next step forward to getting to know each other and becoming friends. Inasa said, excitedly pumping his fists, pushing things farther way faster than Todoroki anticipated. Um, no, that's okay. We don't have to. Todoroki brushed him off. Hey, bottom dwellers. The loud authoritative voice of Gang Orca interrupted them. They both immediately turned and stood at attention for him. Look alive. You're being summoned to the floor. Gang Orca ordered as he explained. Turns out you might be of use, after all. But don't get too excited. You're not getting any credit for this and you're still not a part of the course. You're just bodies for the real students. They followed him as he led them down to where the rest of the students were. He pushed them towards Izuko, Kami, Bakugo and Ida. Izuko and Kami were especially happy to see them. Thank you so much, Mr. Gang Orca, sir. We appreciate it very much, Izuko said as she bowed to the instructor respectfully. Don't ever say I never went easy on ya, Gang Orca said, crossing his arms. Now get to work, fish turds. What's going on? Todoroki asked. I asked Gang Orca if he'd let you use your quirks to help us with our plan. Izuko explained to him. It just seemed like such a waste for you to be here and not be able to use your quirk when it could be really helpful. And he, like, totally agreed to it. Kami told the boys as she wrapped a friendly arm around Izuko's shoulder, like, who could say no to a cutie like this? Haha, <laughs> brilliant, Inasa exclaimed. Finally, I get to play with and befriend all of these passionate young children. Now that the remedial students had their backup players on the field, they were able to fully explain their final plan. Everyone nodded as they agreed to their part. Inasa got them started as he used his wind quirk to blow all the children into the air, carefully controlling the air so that no one would be injured. Then, Kami used her glamour quirk to give the illusion of a beautiful starlit sky with auroras of light surrounding them. Todoroki did as he was instructed to freeze the scattered objects made from the children's quirks into sleek and slippery ice structures that formed into a slide like at an amusement park. Izuko powered herself up at 5% to leap into the air and catch some of the children flying around so she could direct them towards the top of the slide. Once they were sliding down the ice, Todoroki used shots of fire to light the rings that covered the slide. The children's screams of fear and confusion turned into squeals of joy as they made their way down the loops and turns of the slide. Whoa, what? I didn't know these guys could do this. One of the children said in amazement as he saw their quirks being used for something other than fighting. I can't make complicated structures out of my ice yet, so I used the objects you made as a frame for my design. Todoroki told the children, Fortunately, you have some amazing powers. Bakugo watched as everything came together and the kids actually started to enjoy what they were doing. Izuko smiled as their plan was working and she thought back to how it was Kaken who actually said that they should show them how impressive they were and how if they lost to people they looked down on, the children would just feel like crap. It was actually surprising for her to hear that from him. She'd waited years for Kaken to change, to care about other people's feelings. Was it finally happening? What was the final straw for him? Bakugo went up to the ringleader, the boy who stood apart from everyone else and told him, You, too, get in there and have some fun. 
He grabbed the boy by his arm and led him towards the slide, despite his protests. As he looked up as Izuko, who was hopping around to take children to the slide, he told the kid, you're their leader, aren't you? If you keep down on everyone else, you'll never be able to see your own weaknesses. Izuko saw him with the last child who needed his turn. She guided herself towards him and reached her arms out towards Bekugo with her proud smile. He nodded at her as he handed her the young boy so she could take him to the fun ride made of all their creations. When she turned away, he actually smiled back. Once the lesson was over, Gang Orca was proud to tell them that they passed, despite his vague instructions. Their next lesson would be their regular training, which Izuko was looking forward to. The sooner she mastered her regular power, the sooner she could get started on getting a handle on Blackwhip. As they left for the day, they regrouped with their teachers, and Endeavor had a little talk with Shoto in front of his peers. As he spoke, Izuko saw an unusual softness in his eyes. It was very different from the Endeavor she saw at the sports festival, or even the Endeavor who came to rescue her. Even then, he was rough as he tried to slap some sense into her when she resisted. But it looked like Bakugo wasn't the only one who had softened up a bit. Their world was changing after all. It looked like everyone, not just Izuko, was taking this time to reflect and change themselves into who they needed to be to thrive in this new era. Even though Endeavor reached out a hand to his son, Izuko watched Shoto slap it away. He wasn't forgiven just yet. Izuko kept her own secret in the back of her throat. She wanted to tell them, both of them, of what she knew about Dabai. But if she told them at the wrong time, she might ruin something that they desperately needed to fix first. That was something that they all knew as they thought about what they wanted to say to each other on the ride back to school. Timing was everything. When Izuko put on her uniform in the morning, she wasn't going to class first. The remedial course was fun, all things considered, but today was a day for sorrow. She and all of her friends who had taken part in the Shai Hasekai raid were granted permission by All Might and Aizawa to attend Sir Naidai's funeral. Bachako and Tsu remained by her side as they walked to the ceremony, with Kirishima walking behind them. It still hurt that Izuko hadn't been there for his last moments. And while she got to say her goodbyes in the hospital, she had still been clouded by a lot of other worries then. She was so numb to it all. Now, she could focus on warning him and him alone. When All Might said that Nidai had told him that she had changed the future and that he now had faith in her as the successor of one for all, she almost didn't believe him. And unless she heard it out of his own mouth, which was no now longer possible, she'd always have the slightest doubt. But what she didn't question was that Sir Nidai died with a smile on his face. That much she believed wholeheartedly. She remembered how nervous she was when she walked into his office with Mirio for the first time, since all she knew was what she saw of him from TV. Mirio sang him praises, but when they opened the door, the first thing they saw was his psychic bubble girl in a tickle machine. It was really funny looking back on it now that she knew he was just trying to get a good laugh out of her. And then she made that stupid joke to try to make him laugh. She watched everyone who came in to pay their respects. His family, his friends, and his sidekicks from the agency. All Might looked the most grim as he walked up to the beautiful arrangement of flowers. He bowed his head in prayer, and Izuko could feel the grief and regret radiating off of him. It cracked the seal keeping her tears back, and she finally let down a few solid drops down her face. As she cried, Achako and Tsu squeezed her arms. Achako also cried herself. She'd told them about how she still felt guilty for not being able to save Nida, but everyone assured her that she did what she could and she'd gotten him to the paramedics just soon enough to help him have those last few hours instead of dying right there on the battlefield. Once it was Izuko's turn to pay her respects, she walked up to the altar and kneeled before his picture. Even though they had a rough start, Sir Nida still supported her in his own way, and without him, they wouldn't have been able to rescue Iri. She silently promised that she would not let his death be in vain. She would make that future where everyone would be able to smile. After she returned to her place, she watched Mirio say goodbye to his mentor. When they were in the hospital, Mirio promised that he would keep on smiling like Sir Knight I wanted. This was his last chance to publicly express his grief. His somber expression also had an air of determination as he said his last prayer. His declaration was similar to his Yuko's. Quirk or no quirk, he was still going to be the great hero that Knight I said he'd be. Once the funeral ended, the students said goodbye to their work-study mentors as well. Yue was putting the program on hold for the time being. The ever-growing change meant that it was uncertain whether even the most experienced pro heroes could keep their students safe. We'll miss you, Tagata. We can't wait for you to come back to us soon, Sentipter told Mirio as he patted his shoulders proudly. Midoriya, before you go, I have something for you. Bubble Girl caught Izuko's attention. She walked over to her and handed her a tube casing. What is it? Izuko asked as she opened the tube and peeked at the rolled-up paper inside. She quietly gasped as she realized it was the 10th anniversary All Might poster that she had seen in his office. Sir would have wanted you to have it. You're probably the best person here who knows how to properly care for it. Bubble Girl explained. Thank you. Izuko bowed as her tears came out again. I will keep this safe, always. 
The students returned to school in time for their last morning class. While Izuko had let her sad tears out at the funeral, the dreary cloud loomed over her for the rest of the day. She tried to distract herself with her classes and pushed her focus as hard as it could go during her math class. At this point, they were on integrals, so Ectoplasm wrote an equation on the board for them to solve. Although it was of no fault of his own, Izuko still felt apprehensive around him sometimes. The hair on the back of her neck would stand when she considered that he might not be the real ectoplasm. Shigaraki snuck in by pretending to be him after all. She had to look for little clues that it was actually him, like when his sleeves slid down and she could see his actual wrists. Those were so different from Shigaraki that it was a good enough tell for her. That was enough confirmation for her paranoid brain, but her heart still raced with anxiety. As much as she tried to focus on the problem, her eyes kept darting to ectoplasm himself instead of the numbers. She ran her fingers through her hair to calm herself down so she could actually work out the numbers. When she thought she had an answer, she threw her hand up. Midoriya. Ectoplasm called out her name. 107 over 14. Izuko called out confidently. Incorrect. Yeyurazu. Ectoplasm said and moved right onto the next hand. 107 over 28. Momo answered. That's correct. On to the next problem. Ectoplasm moved on and wiped the board clean. Izuko sunk her head into her desk in disappointment. It was just one problem. It shouldn't be a big deal. But saying the wrong answer in front of everybody just made her want to sink through the floor. Her head started throbbing into a painful migraine. She clutched her hair even harder, pressing into her forehead to relieve the pressure inside her. Hey, that was almost right. I wasn't even close to that answer, Minda said from the seat behind her, trying to cheer her up. She appreciated the thought, but it wasn't enough to lift her mood. For the rest of the lesson, even if she double-checked her work and was certain she got the right answer, she didn't dare raise her hand again to say it out loud. After class ended, both Ida and Achako came to her desk to check on her. You okay, Izuko? Achako asked. You seemed really intense during class. Yeah, I just have a headache is all. Izuko explained, standing up from her desk. It's outstanding that you're putting so much effort into your studies, but you shouldn't work yourself sick. Perhaps you need a visit to Recovery Girl. Ida suggested. No, I just need some aspirin. I'll be fine, Izuko said as she walked away from her chair. She passed behind Ayama, who she didn't notice was walking towards her desk. He had already unwrapped one of his snacks and was going to offer her some. Mademoiselle, Ayama turned back around to follow her, but she was already gone. Izuko's migraine only got worse with the noise of the crowd in the hallways. The bright sun shining through the skylights didn't help either. She knew that food would help but she couldn't make it to the cafeteria to get a lunch tray. Instead, she pushed through the pain to make it back to her class dorm. Surely, she had a cup of noodles she could heat up while she tried to lay down and relax. Luckily, she was only on the second floor, so she didn't have to travel much farther. As she walked up the stairs, she noticed that one of the rooms was open. Though it was still bright as day outside, the room was nearly pitch black even darker than her own room would be at this hour. She saw on the nameplate that it was Takoyami's room. That made sense. He probably had blackout curtains that were thicker than her star-spangled ones. It wasn't her room, but she was drawn to it. From what she could see, he had ornate gothic decorations. The only light came from purple-lit candles on black candelabras. There was also a crystal ball that caught her eye. It was very grim, but surprisingly peaceful. There was also an aroma of lavender that helped relieve her migraine. Midoriya, Takoyami noticed her staring as he stood right behind her. Ah, uh, Takoyami, Izuko backed away nervously. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. I was just looking. Your room is very nice by the way. Thank you. Takoyami nodded politely, it is my sanctuary. Izuko walked towards her own room, but felt pained as she walked away from his, like she was denying herself relief. It was a strange whim, but she followed it anyway. Um, Takoyami, she turned back around before he shut his door. He turned to look at her with his usual intimidating stare, so she asked, I if you don't mind, I know this is a strange request, but can I hang out in your room for a little bit? Takoyami pushed the door wide open again and bowed, answering, be my guest. Thank you so much, she said as she sauntered into his room. There were even more interesting things to look at once she was inside. Skulls decorated his desk and walls along with macabre posters. There were cloaks that hung on hooks, probably for occult purposes. She found the source of the pleasant scent, a black rose-shaped plug in that heated scented oils. And there was a sword. That really impressed her. Can I get you something to drink? Takoyami offered. No, I don't need anything. I just want to sit here for a while. Izuko said as she sat cross-legged on the floor against his bed. She closed her eyes and took deep breaths, entering a meditative state. She was still in a somber mood, but now the environment around her matched how she was feeling, and that in itself felt cathartic. Takoyami didn't say anything to her while she was in his room, which was also nice. He just accepted her into his space and nothing more. 
He just ate his lunch at his desk while he caught up on some work for their next class. Once their break was over, they both got up to get back to the classroom. Her migraine was nearly gone and her whole body felt more relaxed. Thanks, Takoyami. I can see why you call it a sanctuary. It's actually really soothing in there. The Zuko said. And where'd you get that plug in? I might need one for my room, too. Online, Takoyami said. The dorms forbid the use of any fire in our rooms, so I have to use diffusers instead of the incense I would at home. Also I had to substitute electronic candles for real ones. That's smart, the Zuko said, pulling on her lip as they walked back to class together. It's so nice in there. Is it okay if I hang out there more often? I don't want to trouble you too much, but it's not a problem. Takoyami insisted. If you feel safe there, then my sanctuary is always welcome to you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Izuko smiled. It was especially kind of him, but she figured she shouldn't be all that surprised. While Takoyami valued his solitude, it never stopped him from being a good friend. He never put his own self-interest ahead of his classmates in need. Once they got back to their seats, Izuko was surprised to find a little present on her desk. There was a plate with a napkin covering the contents. On the napkin was a note in fine penmanship. Missed you in the cafeteria. Did you not eat lunch, Monami? A lady such as yourself shouldn't study on an empty stomach. Feel free to enjoy these tasty assortments. P.S. I know. Izuko was more confused than concerned. She slowly pulled the napkin off and saw several samples of cheese on the plate. She looked up and saw Ayama sitting back at his desk, with a smile on his face as he winked at her. Izuko stared at the plate of cheese on her desk, and then looked at Ayama and then switched between the two. This was unusual, even for him. Ayama always spoke with such grandeur, but he usually tended to focus on himself instead of others. She looked at everyone else's desk and saw that she was the only one who got a plate with him. Why was he singling her out? And what was it exactly that he knew? Something about the league. Her and Shigaraki. The whole class knew the gist of it, but only the girls knew the more explicit details. Even though this was completely out of left field, she still didn't want to be rude. So she took small nibbles as she sat at her desk, still looking at him and giving him a quick thumbs up to tell him that it tasted good. That seemed to satisfy him as he went back to looking at the board. She tried to focus on class, too, but now she had to know. What did he mean by that? Did one of the girls tell him something? Even if they did, what did that matter to him? All of that was over now. Once the day was over, she waited to see if Ayama would come over and explain what he wanted. But he left class with everyone else. Perhaps he didn't want to talk about it with others around, so it really had to be something private. He was so strange, but he was usually harmless. Maybe she was being paranoid and it wasn't as important as she was making it out to be, and he was just being weird. But that night, things got even weirder. She was so tired from class and training that she went to sleep almost immediately. But in the middle of the night, she was woken up by some footsteps and a piercing shriek in the night. She jolted out of bed. Were they under attack? Were the villains back? She saw movement outside of her curtains. She ran to the window and pulled back her curtains to see. Someone being swung around in dark shadows clutches. She turned on her room lights to get a better view. What intentions do you have skulking around at this hour? Takoyami asked sternly. Speak, villain. Takoyami, it's not a villain. It's Ayama. Izuko told him, put him down. Dark Shadow did as she asked and set a shaking Ayama down on her balcony. But Takoyami still reprimanded him. You best have an explanation for such secretive behavior. Midoriya doesn't need intruders interrupting her much needed rest. Thanks Takoyami, but I can handle it from here. Izuko waved her hand as a grateful gesture. It was comforting that he was being protective. Ayama, if you have something you want to say to me, just say it. She exclaimed with her cheeks reddened from being anxious. You've been acting funny around me all day, so just come out with it. Mademoiselle, if you don't mind, Ayama said, shaking as he held a folded bundle in his hands, I think you'd prefer that we be alone for what I want to say. And no, out of the question, Izuko said, not if you're going to be creepy about it. That message earlier, you told me that you know. What do you know? That your quirk isn't compatible with your body, Ayama said nervously as he caught glimpses of dark shadow still peering over his shoulder. W what? Izuko backed up. That wasn't the answer she expected at all. And that means, you're like me. He said softly. Like you, she asked. Takoyami also cocked his head as Dark Shadow finally backed off. I've had to wear my support belt since I was small. Because without it, sometimes my navel laser will just leak out on its own. I was just born that way. With a body that wasn't able to handle my quirk. That's what the doctor said. Ayama explained. When you first started here, you couldn't control your power at all. I've always thought you were similar. But when you were gone, I thought I'd lost my chance to tell you. And then... The longer we waited, the more worried I was that your power was actually hindering your escape instead of aiding it. Since if you couldn't control it, then you couldn't trust it to help you. You figured all of that out. This whole time, Izuko asked. 
No longer nervous and actually impressed, he was pretty much right on the money. The whole time she was captured, she was afraid to use her quirk and break her limbs beyond repair. That's why she sought out different options and ended up staying longer than expected, but that still didn't explain one thing. Well if you wanted to talk to me about that, why didn't you just come up and ask me? And what was with the cheese? I wanted to surprise you because surprises always make me feel better. Ayama said with his signature twinkle in his eye, and unfolded the cloth in his hands, Look, I was even coming to bring you more cheese. When she saw the sticks of cheese unveiled from his bundle, Izuko just lost it. She started with a small chuckle that just exploded into loud unbridled wheezing laughter. She'd been worried about it all day, and it was just so simple. Ayama, why you can't just Izuko wiped her tears through her laughter, you can't just scare me like that. Next time you want to tell me something, just tell me. We, mademoiselle. Ayama bowed respectfully before handing her the bundle of cheese. Please, take this as a token of my apology, and as a reminder that I'll always be here to support you so you can twinkle more than ever. During training the next day, Izuko and Ayama were friendlier with each other than ever. He even brought her some homemade pastries for her to try. When they focused on quirk training and gym gamma, Ayama had something new to show her. Watch this, he said in a coy tone as he leaned over the rock formation, shooting out a large beam right through it. Feast your eyes on my new move, the naval buffet laser. As he announced it, smaller short beams started firing from his shoulder pads, having been redirected from his stomach. Wow, that looks so pretty. Kazuko complimented it, and it allows you to shoot your beams from different directions at once. As she talked about it, he started spelling out words with the concentrated beam from his abdomen, but then he fell to his knees as his stomach started to hurt. Ah, be careful. Izuko rushed over to him. Don't overdo it just to impress me. As she helped him up, some of her surrounding classmates caught a glimpse of the two. Ayama rarely socialized with anyone, so seeing him seek Izuko's attention was surprising. It also made the ones who already liked her feel the heat of jealousy. But there was nothing to worry about. Ayama, like Takoyami, was just being a friend when she needed one. No one in the class wanted to take her friendship for granted again. Hey guys, Simir, check this out. Mina called everyone's attention before class started. She made some space on the floor so she could show them her new breakdancing moves. What started with simple steps turned into a jump and spin on the floor. Haha, <laughs> I'm a breakdancing queen. Everyone cheered in awe. And Ayama held his chin as he commented. She's obviously practiced extensively. Why are you wearing shorts under your skirt? Mind a wind, which earned him several smacks from Hagakure. I bet Ashido's skills end up being super useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Izuko jotted down in her notebook as she noticed the martial aspect of her dance moves. When it comes to a fight, she would have complete control over every part of her body. We, I've witnessed that. Ayama said in an annoyed fashion. She burned through my cape in our first training match and then in the sports festival finals. I will never forget that. Um, maybe I should take up dancing, too. Izuko considered, trying to think back on if she'd ever given it a try before. Suddenly, she remembered that belly dancing video Magni had brought for one of their girls' nights, the one that inspired her to use her legs more to avoid breaking her arms. One of the softer, brighter memories in darker times that kept her from losing her sanity. Hey, she could teach you. Denki suggested. Yeah, girlfriend, show me what you got, Mina said, which officially put her on the spot. I, well, Izuko scratched her cheek. The moves in Magna's DVD were a little risque. She didn't want to show everyone those. So she asked, could you show me how first? We'll start with something easy. Step forward and back and left and right while swinging both arms. Make sure you're staying loose. Mina instructed. Sure, Izuko said nervously. Mina said it was easy, but staying loose wasn't Izuko's style. She tried the moves as she instructed, but her rigid arms and legs made hard stomping instead of fluid steps. Ayama tried it with her and was equally uncoordinated. Yeah, that's a good start. Mina said to encourage them rather than embarrass them. Once Mr. Aizawa entered the room, class officially started. He opened homeroom with the exciting news that even the average Japanese student looked forward to. It's coming, the school festival, he said dryly. Normal school staff, half the class cheered in relief. So awesome, gotta love this time of year. We gotta think of something cool to do. Hold on, Mr. Aizawa, are you sure this is okay? Hiroshima asked, speaking for the other half of the students who were all too aware of the risk of letting their guards down after everything that had happened. SSHH, Kirishima, don't ruin this, Kaminari said. Think about it, though. There are villains everywhere right now, Kirishima continued. You're right. That's a reasonable point. However, there are students here besides those in the hero course. You get the spotlight every year at the sports festival. This is for everyone else. The support course, general studies, and don't forget the business course students. This doesn't get as much attention as the sports fest, but it's still the yearly event they all look forward to. Mr. Aizawa explained, still wrapped up in his sleeping bag. Izuko gulped and felt that guilty feeling sinking in her chest. 
She felt like she'd already ruined the license exam for nearly half of the class, and she heard whispers about how Class 1A had taken out their grief on some of the other classes. The longer she was gone, the worse their reputation as hero students became. The friendly rivalry with Class 1B had turned into an actual rift, and poor Hitoshi Shinsu had been singled out and accused of having something to do with her kidnapping. All of those terrible feelings, they didn't just go away when she came back. Many of your peers are feeling stressed out but the current conditions here at UA, especially the dorm system which had to be adopted because of the hero course. Mr. Aizawa continued, when you put it like that, I guess it would be unfair to cancel it. Kirishima conceded and sat back down. Correct. So yeah, it's still on. And hopefully everyone will enjoy it. Though unlike festivals in the past, this year's will only be open to UA students and staff, with a few exceptions. You may not be the focus this time, but your class still needs to participate with some kind of original programming. You need to decide what you want to do today. He finished as he tucked himself in the corner and went to sleep immediately. It looked like it was one of those days where they were on their own. Ida took over the class discussion from there, opening the floor to everyone's ideas, and that meant everyone. Each student had their own idea, including food booths, maid cafes, death matches, dancing, instructional lectures, study parties, and so on. Izuko would have suggested a hero trivia bowl, but from everyone else's answers, it sounded like she was the only one who would be interested in something like that. Still, everyone else's answers sounded so fun. She trusted that whatever they chose, it would be a great time for everyone involved. The class discussion didn't really sway one way or the other. The only choices that had gotten truly knocked out were the more educational ones that weren't very fun. By the time class was over, they had yet to come to a consensus. Mr. Aizawa said that if they didn't come up with an idea by the morning, they'd end up doing a school lecture. It was possible that he was bluffing, like when he threatened to expel students, but they didn't want to risk finding out. It was especially important to Izuko that they decide on something good. She felt like she owed it to not only her class, but the rest of the school. Her class was determined to pick something that night. However, students who were in the raid had extra work they needed to catch up on. As much as she really wanted to help decide on their program, she knew her homework was more important. She clenched her book bag in her hands. Maybe if she did the work really fast, she could help out before everyone called it a night. She ran up to her room to start on her work as quickly as possible, passing back Hugo who was also heading to his room. He didn't have extra classwork, but his usual bedtime of 8.30 was approaching. She guessed that once they shot down his deathmatch idea, he had no further interest in what they were doing. She hoped that he'd at least take part in whatever they decided. After all, he actually made an impressive effort to win over the children at the remedial lesson. She paused on the stairs and watched him slam his bedroom door. If they were still together, or even just friends, she'd be studying quietly in his room as he slept. He didn't care if she left the desk light on, as long as she didn't make any noise. She continued her ascent to her own room. She threw her book bag on the bed and pulled out the day's worksheets. She groaned as she looked it over and realized that the 10 questions in the packet had multiple parts, so she actually had more like 25 minus 30 questions, some of which required textual evidence from the book. It took much longer than she expected. Even when she pushed through the fatigue and finished it all without as much as a quick snack break, the clock showed it was past curfew. Even if her class wanted to continue talking about the cultural festival, they wouldn't be allowed. Mr. Aizawa was adamant about everyone being in bed on time, which was ironic coming from the teacher who slept through his own class regularly. She defeatedly dragged herself out of her desk chair and changed for bed. She probably wouldn't have been much help anyway. What she found fun was different from what most people found fun. She trusted that the rest of the class decided on something really cool. Whatever they picked, she promised to give it her all. She slipped under her covers in her pajamas after she turned out the lights. As tired as she was, she found it difficult to go to sleep. She tossed and turned, rousing from almost sleep so that she'd have to start over. Finally, she got comfy on her back, with her All Might pillow resting on her arm. Then, she could hear a light thumping, like footsteps. It wasn't enough to make the floors creak, but they sounded like they were coming closer to her. Her eyes weren't open, but she could feel something approaching. She couldn't move. Then, she felt the pressure on her body. Her legs sunk further in the mattress. Something grazed her arms and interlocked its fingers with hers. Suddenly, she felt a light touch on her lips, like she was being softly kissed. She opened her eyes, or at least she thought she did. She saw a skinny shadowy figure hovering over her, which made her insides do a painful turn, but she didn't even jolt awake. Her body was stiff and wouldn't budge. The figure had a slow, raspy breath which she could feel on her neck. It dropped until she was consumed by its darkness which held every part of her body hostage. Even as she lay still, she could feel its warm hands move her arms and legs around as it pleased. Stop. Let me go. She wanted to say, but her lips remained shut. She hoped that whatever this creature was could read her thoughts. She could still hear its breathing from the side of her head, 
but its voice came from inside her mind. You're mine. Izuko jolted as she broke free from her sleep paralysis. She sat up and looked around the empty room. No one. She moved her fingers and toes around to regain control of her body. As she rubbed her face, she felt the tears that had poured out as soon as she woke up. She buried herself into her knees, squeezing her legs as she kept crying. It was just a nightmare. She was safe now. She knew who that demon was supposed to be, and she reminded herself that none of her friends or teachers would ever let him get her again. But still, she felt him. She felt him on every inch of her skin. For the rest of the night, he was all she could think about. By sheer willpower, she was able to go back to sleep. Despite her dreadful night, Izuko had a nice day to look forward to. Iri was finally out of quarantine, and her first request for visitors were the two heroes she was the most grateful for. With Mr. Aizawa there to supervise them, Izuko and Mirio rushed up to Iri's room as soon as they could. They knew exactly where it was, since they had looked through the door window so many times before just to catch a glimpse of her. Iri. She and Mirio exclaimed in unison as the door opened and they found Iri sitting on her bed in her hospital gown. Her hair was neatly brushed, having received actual care from the staff. I'm so sorry we couldn't come see you sooner, Izuko said, with stars in her eyes, like she was reuniting with an old friend. We brought you a fruit basket, though. Hope you're feeling hungry, Mirio said as he held up a basket of fresh fruit picked from the grocery store. He and Izuko picked them out together just before they got there. What's your favorite fruit? Oh, let me guess. Peaches are your fave, right? Because you're a peach. Iri held the basket in her hand with a stoic face. The expression was lost on her. She just calmly answered, apples. Yeah, that's totally what I meant. Mirio laughed as he took the apple out of the basket. Let's get this sucker peeled for you. It'll be delicious. He pulled a peeler from the pocket of his bowling shirt and expertly cut the apple into slices before going for the peels. Izuko gasped, are you making them into little bunnies? That's so cute. Let me try. Of course. Mirio handed her the peeler after making the first rabbit perfectly. Izuko was as careful as she could be, trying not to slice her fingers, but the ears came out all jagged. Um, I don't think it's as good as yours. Izuko murmured. Are you kidding? That looks great. The nick on its ears gives him more character. Mirio encouraged her, here, try another one. So she tried again, this time focusing more on the apple peel than her own fingers, and it came out somewhat better. See, you got the hang of it, already. These look super delicious. He said, don't they, Uri? Uri just nodded her head. She didn't reach for them right away, so they just put the apple bunnies on a plate for her to enjoy later. This whole time, even when I had a fever, Uri said quietly, all I could think about was how much you did for me, how you saved me. I'm not even sure if I heard your name right. It was Izuko, right? Izuko Shigaraki. Izuko held in a gasp. That was what she heard because that's what Overhaul called her. You can just call me Izuko. Izuko Midoriya. She told her with an unworried smile, or Deku. That's my hero name. And it's probably easier to remember. Because it's shorter. Hero name. Iri asked. It's like a nickname sort of. She said. Deku. Iri repeated the name. Yeah, that's right. Izuko smiled proudly at her. So, Lemillion and Deku. And then... There was a man wearing glasses. All of you ended up getting hurt real bad because of me, Hiri said sadly, the guilt visible on her face, tears pouring from her eyes. It's all my fault. All the terrible stuff that happened. I'm so sorry. My fault. All my fault. My friends failed their licensing exams because they were worried about me. Everyone hates my class because of me. My mom nearly broke down because I wasn't home. All Might was withering away into nothing. Hizuko's eyes widened as Hiri's voice resembled her own intrusive thoughts. I know that. You lost your power because you were protecting me, Lemillion. Iri continued crying, but then she felt his firm hand on her head, softly petting her. Iri, I guarantee that none of us think this was your fault at all. He said so tenderly, but you know what we are thinking though. Man, I am stupid glad that Iri's okay. So you see, there's no point in apologizing. Promise, don't worry about it. Besides, everyone fought because they wanted to see you smile. Izuko wanted to keep smiling, as Mirio was, to cheer up Iri. But as she listened to Iri blame herself for everything, she knew that as kind as Mirio's words were, the voice in her head was even louder. It was going to take more than that to actually hear them and truly believe them. Then, she watched as Iri grunted and her lips quivered. She tried to push up her cheeks. Mirio looked at Iri in confusion, but Izuko knew what she was trying to do, and it made her own eyes turn red as they welled up. She looked away for a brief moment to keep herself from crying. I'm sorry, I don't remember how to smile, Iri said. Izuko covered her mouth and inhaled deeply. Of course, she knew exactly what that was like. When the darkness that surrounds you, keeps you from the light of everyone trying to reach you. It was that bubble that kept you from truly reuniting from everyone and everything you once loved. She wished she could tell her how to break out of it, but honestly, she still felt like she was in it herself. The most she could do for now was keep reaching, keep pressing against that bubble, with the hope that someday, it would pop. 
Izuko reached Freire's hand to hold it, letting her own tears flow instead of holding them back. She looked deep into her eyes until she saw herself in them. It's okay, Ari. Izuko said, I, I think I know how you feel. Someone hurt me once, too. I know it's hard, so don't rush yourself right now. You'll remember how to smile someday. I promise. Her tears made Ari's tears come down even more, so Izuko got closer to her, pulling her in so that they could cry together in an embrace. Mirio watched with a sense of awe. He thought that he and Midoriya were in an agreement to keep smiling so that Ari would feel better, but then, she just totally turned the table. She decided to cry instead. He had his own sorrows that collected inside of him, his own guilt and regret, but he decided not to join them. Instead, he stood up and patted both of their backs before returning to Mr. Aizawa, who was watching from the doorway, to give them some privacy. Heh, <sighs> I guess I'll just give them a moment then. Is it lame for me to bail like this? I don't know. Mirio whispered as he rubbed the back of his neck. No, I think it's what they needed. Aizawa told him as he watched through the door. It's kind of cool though. How Midori is so comfortable with crying in front of other people. Sure takes a lot of guts, Mirio said, letting his own smile finally fade. Throughout all his time in the hero course, and during his internship with Sir Nidai, everyone taught him to keep smiling. Smile through adversity and smile through pain and sadness. Smiling during those hard times was strength. That's what they always said. He was sure Midoriya was taught the same. But, here she was, crying, letting her sadness be known. And that, that seemed to reach her in a way that he couldn't. But even knowing that, he still wanted to help in his own way. To make them smile again. He had to think of something. Something happy to balance out the sadness. It didn't have to be something right now. It could be something to look forward to. Then, it hit him. Mr. Aizawa, do you think that Uri would be able to leave the hospital for just one day? Mirio asked. After conferring his idea and getting tentative approval from the teacher, Mirio re-entered the room with exciting news. Hey guys, I just had the best idea ever. Uri can come to the UA festival with us. He announced happily. Festival? What's that? Uri asked, with her tears all out of her system. It's the best. You're gonna have so much fun. A school festival is a festival that takes place at our school. It's great. All the students plan super duper exciting things for the rest of the classes to have fun with. There are different games and performances and they sell food. Oh, and get this. I bet there'll be candy apples there. Mirio explained in excitement. Tagata, that's a great idea. Izuko cheered on. Her own tears dried up as well. What are candy apples? Iri asked. It's when they dip an apple into some crackly sugar stuff and make it even sweeter. Mirio explained. Iri was drooling just from the idea of it. Can we really do that, Mr. Aizawa? Izuko asked, getting excited as well. I'll talk it over with the principal, Aizawa said as he dialed on his phone. What do you think, Iri? Does that sound like something you want to try? Izuko asked her. Iri looked at the both of them, who were smiling again. You know, a minute ago, when I wasn't sure of your name, I was sad and didn't know what to do. Because I knew that more than anything I just wanted to be friends with the people who helped me. That makes me so happy to hear. Izuko patted her red eyes. Because that's what we wanted, too. Mirio exclaimed with pumped fists. And this is what friends do. They do fun things together, they laugh together, and they cry together, too. Izuko said. We should start putting a case together to convince the principal so that he can't say no. Mirio said. Yeah. Izuko jumped up in excitement. I'm on a break from school right now, so I can totally hang out with you before our festival date. Mirio said. Our date? Iri asked. Haha, I don't think date is the right word. Izuko blushed. It's when two people who like each other spend time together. Mirio explained. So, are you two on a date right now? Iri said as her eyes switched between Izuko and Mirio. Ah, oh, Izuko choked and covered her face as her body turned red from her toes up to her face. Mirio just laughed hysterically until he fell on the floor. The next day was more makeup classes after school for the work-study students, which meant they still couldn't help out with the festival just yet. I'm so sorry. Izuko bowed as she stood between Achako and Tsuyu. Aw, oh, there's no need to apologize. We'll handle the school festival prep while you catch up. Anjiro assured her. Thanks. Hopefully we'll be able to help you soon. Achako assured him. Together, the three girls and Kirishima returned to Mr. Aizawa's classroom. The rest of the class made the walk back to the dorms, discussing their plans for their concert. We have so many decisions to make about costumes and choreography, Mina said in excitement. What kind of music do you think the rest of the school will enjoy? Shoji asked. We should do whatever's trendy. Right, Jiro? Denki suggested. Bakugo walked beside them without adding any input. He was disappointed that his class picked something that had no actual combat. It felt like a waste of time, singing and dancing when they could have been training. The teachers said they were doing this so that students could relax. But Bakugo found fighting and training to be very relaxing, and he couldn't be the only one at this hero school who felt that way. As they walked, he overheard some of the general studies students talking about them while giving them the side eye. 
Did you hear that Class 1 is doing a concert? And it's for us. A tall student with a pronounced chin said in a biting tone. Oh my god, talk about egotistical. Do they really think that a little show is gonna make us forget that they took the villain girl back? I mean, we knew they were reckless, but now they're just putting the whole school in danger. A girl with short pigtails said. Like why don't they take a hint already? They were attacked by villains. And then what did they do? They went to a summer camp where, of course, they got attacked again. And if that wasn't enough, that explosion guy got kidnapped, but was suddenly fine as soon as he came back a couple days later, like nothing happened. The chin boy added, and it still wasn't over. That crazy girl who broke her fingers got kidnapped, but this time, they take a whole month to find her, just milking the attention to make us feel sorry for them. Like, I'm not saying she was their leader or anything, but like, I don't believe she was completely innocent in all this. Those villains had a whole month to kill her and they just let her live. Something's fishy there. And their whole class is covering for her. The girl continued. They're probably in on it. The boy added, delving further into the conspiracy. Back Hugo was so close to just storming in and giving them the business for running their mouths. But they had already gotten in enough trouble for biting back when people talked shit. It wasn't worth the effort. But it pissed him off to no end to hear them talk about him and his class like they knew them. They didn't know the first thing about them. Especially if they thought that Midoriya was some kind of villain. If she was, Bakugo would probably be dead already, since she had this way of getting stronger and smarter behind his back. If she had really decided to use her powers for evil, she wouldn't be wasting her time with makeup classes right now. When they made it back to the dorms, the class started talking about what kind of music they should play. They discussed what was the most popular type of music that would get everyone dancing. Because this show was for them, the other students, the ones that were suffering because of their class. Then, they moved on to what kind of instruments they should play, since they were going to be performing this show live. Jiru stated that drums were the backbone to any band and would take it on herself if no one else was able to. Bakugo twitched as he dreaded what was coming. Hey, didn't you accidentally admit that your parents made you take music classes when you were a kid? Denki asked him, calling him out in front of everyone. Huh? Bakugo kept his hands in his pockets, pretending that he wasn't listening. Everyone turned to him in shock and raved with delight. Awesome, take a seat and show us what you got, Ciro said as he held the drumsticks in his hands. In your dreams, moron. Bakugo turned away from them. Right, I bet the drums are too hard for you. Ciro taunted him, pushing just the right buttons to get Bakugo to do it, since now, on principle, he had to prove it to them that he could. He took his seat on Jiru's drum set that she brought out and played a short riff without even putting his socks on. Even if it had been a while, his muscles remembered the moves. Well, he said, seeing their faces covered with awe. That was killer, Jiru said, dropping her jaw. He's so good. Wad have known that you got talent. That's it. Bakugo's gotta be our drummer, Denki declared. Huh? Bakugo huffed as he stood back up and walked away. No way am I making a fool of myself up on that stage. Bakugo, come on. Do it. If we rock this, everyone will have a great time. Jiru chased after him, trying to convince him. Don't you get what's gonna happen? Bakugo snapped back. I'll spell it out for you. We're doing this because we want to let the other courses know they can trust us again, right? But no matter what we do, they're always gonna see us as the troublemakers who cause all their problems. So we're just trying to make ourselves feel better, and it's gonna seem like a slap in the face from the people they can't stand. Jiru went quiet, and Hagakure quickly responded, Don't be rude. We're just trying to do something nice. Yeah, that kind of thinking is what I'm talking about. Bakugo shouted. I see. Perhaps he's right. Ada thought about it. Did we think this through enough? You didn't help us decide what to do, so you can't complain now. Todoroki countered. Doesn't all this make you mad? It's not like we wanted the villains to show up and ruin things for everybody. We didn't ask to be taken hostage, and she sure as hell didn't ask to be. Bakugo took a second to breathe. Why do we have to be so concerned about how those weaklings feel? Stop trying to get on their good side. We're not here to make friends, we're here to fight. If we're gonna put on a show, then we do it for us so we can't hold anything back. Let's murder everyone in UA with our killer music. That speech made everyone cheer, because whether they understood him or not, he was going to play in the band. His closer circle of friends, like Denki, Mina and Siro crowded around him. Ida and Todoroki, however, saw there was more to it and stayed back as they watched him. So it's about that, then, Todoroki said. At the summer training camp, Bakugo was the first to be taken by the villains. And when we rescued him, we lost Midoriya in the process. He's been carrying that burden with him, even after she came back. Ida added, both Todoroki and Ida both carried at least some guilt for her disappearance themselves. Maybe if one or both of them had escorted her back to her apartment on that day, then she might not have gotten taken. Bakugo was tied up at the police station at that time, so it couldn't have been him even if he wanted. Still, as her former lover, the fact that there was nothing he could do to save her probably hurt him more than it hurt them, even though they had feelings for her, too. 
she probably didn't even want his protection anymore. Finally, after hours of work, the work-study students were finished with their makeups. They burst through the dormitory entrance. Hey, sorry we're back so late, Izuko said as soon as she walked in, carrying a worn-out Uraraka. Now we can help out for real, Achako said. See you confirmed this with a ribbit. Mina was excited to explain to them everything they had planned so far. The concert, the rave rock music, Jiru on bass, Momo on keys, and Bakugo on the drums. Bakugo on the drums. That's kind of. Achako started. But Izuko was getting those stars in her eyes again. Shocking. Hagakure finished for her. You got a problem with that. Bakugo snapped. You're really picking up the drums again. Izuko clapped her hands together and barged towards him, getting close to his face. That's incredible. I haven't heard you play in so long. You were so good back then. I can't wait to hear you play now. Bakugo was so surprised to have her so close to him again that he couldn't help but turn his head away. Shut up. I can't believe you actually remember that. That wasn't completely true. Izuko remembered everything, and he knew that. He couldn't hide anything from her. Question, who will be singing? So you changed the topic, isn't that the most important thing? So that brought up the conversation on the front of the band, the singer. Achako suggested Jiru. But she wasn't so sure, since singing on top of playing the bass was a lot more added pressure. Minta, Ayama. And Kirishima volunteered to sing, but Minta's voice could only be described as screeching, Ayama was horribly off-key, and Kirishima was just a different genre altogether. That just made it clearer that Jiru should also be the singer. Hagakure put the mic in front of her, and the rest of the class begged to hear her voice. Jiru nervously took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Then, she let out the most beautiful singing voice they'd ever heard. Everyone was so quiet in awe. When she finished, Jiru opened her eyes sheepishly and everyone cheered for her. My ears are so happy. Achako exclaimed. You have such a sultry voice. Mina cheered. That was amazing. Izuko was almost brought to tears over such a lovely voice. All right, I'd call this a unanimous decision. Ada declared. Well, let's set that aside then. Jiru, blushing from embarrassment, quickly moved on. Now, we need guitars, I'm thinking too. Oh yeah, pick me. It's so cool to play instruments. Denki volunteered. Let me strum. Minda also wanted to get involved, since he truly believed being in a band would help him get chicks. I'd just break the strings, Kirishima said dejectedly. Don't you dare volunteer unless you're gonna kill it, dimwit, Bakugo told Denki. Now that Bakugo was officially involved in the festival, he wouldn't accept anything less than a totally awesome show. That made Izuko even happier, since she was worried he'd call the whole thing stupid and bring the whole mood down. Yeah, I totally will. Denki said with full enthusiasm, strumming on the guitars that Jiru had brought down from her room. Minda tried to play with him, but his arms unfortunately couldn't reach around to meet the strings. My fingers won't reach because of my character design. Minda complained as he ran off. As everyone discussed what part they would play in the performance, Izuko looked at the second guitar. Her fingers had already taken a lot of beatings from fighting, so she doubted that they'd have the right precision needed to play an instrument like the guitar. But then, Takoyami unexpectedly picked it up and started riffing from it himself. It's like that riff is speaking directly to my heart, Kirishima said. You can play. Why didn't you say anything? Shoji asked. I put down the axe when I was bested by the F chord. Takoyami admitted. Minta, if you can't play for yourself, then I will strum for you, as well. When Minta grumbled and sulked, Mina offered something to cheer him up. Minta, will you be a part of the dance team if I can get a harem together? That did the trick. So the class was divided into three groups, the band team, the effects team, and the dance team. Izuko said that she wanted to help out in any way that she could, but choosing was so hard. What is it that you want to do, Izuko? Mina asked her. I'm not sure. I'm not really experienced in any of those things. Izuko muttered. Just try something new. It'll be fun. What's the thing that's calling out to you the most? Achako said. Um, um Izuko thought about it and remembered how watching Mina dance during class was wonderful and how she wanted to be able to move like her. But to dance for real, in front of a crowd, that was really nerve-wrecking, to go back into the spotlight and have people watching her. So she answered, I think, my talents would be best utilized. On the effects team. Cool, the effects team it is. Hiroshima cheered, pulling her into the group with himself, Koda, Siro, Ayama and Todoroki. We could really use your strength for holding Ayama over the crowd. Todoroki told her. We, I trust my entire shimmering body to you, Monami. Ayama exclaimed. Great, I can't wait. Izuko smiled. It felt good to finally have her makeup work finished, both for the month she was gone and for the work study, but Izuko knew she still had a lot on her plate. The nightmares and episodes of sleep paralysis didn't stop over the weekend. The League of Villains were still out there, and they weren't going to stop. The most she could do to prepare for their inevitable return was to continue her training. But training her quirk had already become more difficult. She and All Might agreed that she should lock her new Black Whip quirk until she had a better grip on the main one for all quirk. 
but she worried that she may not have the time to put it off. Plus, the former users told her that she'd be getting even more quirks soon. She wanted to know what they were and have some sort of handle on them before she faced the league again. The good news was that she wouldn't be alone. She was so proud to see all of her friends getting stronger. They seemed more like pros every day. But still, a grating lump in her throat always appeared when she was close to some of them. Whenever she looked at Todoroki, she could see his resemblance to Dabai. She wanted to tell Shoto about his brother so badly, but she didn't know what he would do. Was it possible that he already knew? Before she truly befriended him, Shoto always had this gloomy aura around him. It wasn't until they got closer at the sports festival and the Hasu incident that she saw his kindness and humor behind his stoic face. He also became more transparent with his problems, making sure everyone knew that he hated his father, even if they didn't ask. If he knew his older brother was a villain, he would have told her. He would have said something after the training camp where they met Dabai. She knew she thought about this before, but it still didn't make sense to her. Shoto saw Dabai with his own eyes. Did he recognize him and not say anything? Did he even know he had another older brother? Izuko didn't want to approach Shoto with such shocking news if she didn't know much he already knew. At best, it would distract him. At worst, it could break him. She had to trust that the right moment would come along and she could wait until then. But Shoto wasn't the only one who gave her knots in her stomach. Kakin still did as well. It was sort of embarrassing for her. She was the one who ended it. But she had loved him for so long that she still felt that pull towards him. When she was younger, she thought it meant they were soulmates. When they first came to UA, that's when their relationship took a turn for the worse, but that didn't mean that Kakin himself wasn't getting better. He was making more friends, better friends in her opinion, and he was starting to act more like a hero around everyone, except for her. That's why she dumped him. When they were paired up against All Might, he refused to cooperate with her. She tried to reason with him, bargain with him, even beg him to just look at her, but it was like he wanted to cut off his nose to spite his face. It was like he wanted her to fail, even if it meant he would fail, too. At first she thought that's how he'd always be with her from now on. Even when she was rescued, he was cold and distant towards her, like he had no remorse. But then, he slowly started warming up again. They worked together in the remedial course, and he even gave her the dignity of the truth when she asked about what happened when she was gone. And then the other day, he agreed to play the drums for the class band. That made her so happy, and he didn't feel threatened by her excitement. It truly felt like they were starting over, but it was too late. She wasn't in love with him anymore. It brought tears to her eyes. Why couldn't he do this? Why couldn't he be like this? When they were still together, was that just not possible? Should she even try getting closer to him again, even as a friend, or would it undo all their hard work? Breaking up seemed to be the best thing that happened to both of them, so maybe it was smarter to keep each other at arm's length. But that conflicted with what she'd already decided, that she needed everyone's help when the league came back. Maybe she needed an outside opinion on this, so she texted All Might and asked him to meet him in the forests outside the dorms, where it was private and peaceful. I'm glad you called. I heard you caught up with your schoolwork. That's great. I knew that was keeping you busy, so I didn't want to bother you. All Might said with his hands on his hips and a small smile as he stood in the grass. He saw the troubled expression on her face and asked quietly, Is something wrong? No, not really, Izuko said, adjusting the sleeves of her gym uniform. I was just thinking about what we said before, about how I keep Black Whip locked away until I'm ready for it. Did something happen? Another dream? All Might asked. No, not quite. Not that kind of dream. Izuko sighed and cleared her throat. I've just been having these feelings. Like Shigaraki and the League. We'll come back before we know it. I don't want either of us to be caught off guard again. I just, I feel him. I know you're scared. All Might walked over to her to put his big warm hand on her shoulder. I'm sorry we failed you then, but you'll never have to face him alone again. That's what we're all here for. Every pro hero out there is ready to protect you. Are they ready, though? Izuko asked, which took All Might aback. So she clarified, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say that they're weak, but they don't even know just how long this fight has been going on. They're just starting to find out about all for one, and they don't even know about one for all. I know this secret is important, but we lost Sir Nidai. That's one less person who knows what we're dealing with. I know you told my mom, but I still haven't told any of my friends, and they're the ones who are actually training. Who is it that you want to tell? All Might asked. I don't know. I just considered it. Who would you have told if I never came back? Izuko asked. All Might went quiet, but she didn't let up. It had to have crossed your mind at some point, that maybe I was truly gone and took one for all with me. I always had faith that you would come back. All Might asserted. You don't have to say that just to protect my feelings. Izuko's face went cold. Even if you couldn't get one for all back, you would have had to tell people. The other pros, maybe. You're the symbol of peace. You wouldn't have just let the world secretly fall into chaos. So I want to know, if I was truly gone, and you had no one left, who would you have turned to? Midoriya, listen. 
I'm not protecting your feelings. When I chose you as my successor, I placed all of my hope in you. When you disappeared, I promised your mother to bring you back even if it cost me my life, and I meant it. I would have died before I had the chance to do what you're imagining. All Might said, looking into her eyes so she could see he was speaking the truth. That doesn't sound very responsible. Izuko didn't know what else to say, looking away when she felt All Might's gaze burning through her. I can't argue with you there. All Might pulled away and actually thought about it. He wasn't lying, but she still didn't seem to believe him, so he might as well give an answer that would satisfy her otherwise he knew it would consume her. Midoriya really couldn't let anything go. I did tell you that I came to teach at UA to find a successor, so if I lost you, I would have had no choice but to turn to your classmates. Which one? Izuko asked. Well, you're their friend. Who should it have been? All Might asked, turning it back on her. As much as she was presenting this as a hypothetical, he connected it back to his earlier question. He remembered that she almost told young Bakugo and he scolded her for it. But things were different now. She was right. Villains were growing and threatening their world faster than anyone could make sense of. Maybe it was time to let more people into their struggle. But he didn't want to be reckless and accidentally let the wrong people in. People who didn't understand. And people who would only become targets once they knew. I'm asking you because I trust you as my successor. All Might repeated his question. Who do you want to tell about one for all? Izuko put her finger on her chin as she contemplated. A while back, Kakin would have been her first choice, but now she wasn't so sure, since she just decided it would be better if they kept apart and telling him the secret would bring them dangerously close again. Or maybe it was too selfish to keep him out of the loop to protect her own feelings. She also considered Mirio, as he probably would have been the successor had she not been chosen, but he already had plenty of his own struggles without bringing one for all into the mix. Or maybe that's why he needed to know. If he was going to continue his own hero journey, he needed to find his own part in the future that was coming, the future that Night Eye had already known and chose him for. But then again, she could say the same thing about anyone in the school. They were all training to be heroes and they all had their futures to consider. Well, the more I think about it, I want to tell. Izuko took a deep breath and answered, I want to tell everyone. Black, all might hacked and coughed up blood in shock. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. That was too much, wasn't it? Izuko panicked and pulled a handkerchief from her pocket that she kept for these incidents. Yeah, let's start with one person. All Might said as he wiped the blood off of his chin. Think of one person you truly trust and then get back to me. Yeah, I can do that. Izuko nodded. In the meantime, you also mentioned you wanted to talk about Black Whip. All Might changed the subject. Have you used it at all since we last spoke? No, I'm scared that it'll go crazy again. Izuko said. Well, you have to remember. You were in a heightened emotional state when it first came out, and one for all is tied to your emotions. All Might reminded her. You're right. During my fight with Overhaul, I just, I don't think I'd ever felt that much hatred before, even with Shigaraki. Just when I was accepting what was done to me. To think of Iri going through that kind of pain. Someone even younger than me. I lost control. Izuko explained openly. And do you feel that now? All Might asked. Not nearly as much. Izuko said. But that's probably because I know Iri's safe right now. Still, if I could get it to a point where it was powerful enough without losing control, then it would be a very helpful tool for long-range attacks. Long-range attacks, huh? Yeah, I haven't seen you make much use of those. But you don't need Black Whip for that. If you use one for all with only a fraction of your power All Might started, but then suddenly a burst of wind pressure blew past his face. He covered his face and stood his ground to keep from falling over until the wind died down. He looked up and saw Izuko with her arm out and her palm outstretched. She'd activated only a small percentage of one for all and let it flow from her chest as she'd thrown her arm out to make a concentrated wave of air pressure guided by her hand. Yeah, something like that. All Might rubbed the back of his head and chuckled. When did you learn how to do that? You told me you had nothing. That you had no one anymore. That this was all you had left. Tenko yelled, balling his fingers into fists. Who did you call? He took another step towards her, and she panicked. Stop. She screamed, and then activated one for all. A steady stream of glowing energy surged from her chest to her arm as she thrust her arm out towards his chest to keep him at a distance. The strong push of air gave off a blast of power without her even making contact with him. It swiftly threw him across the bar, into the bottles of the alcohol on the shelves, many of which shattered against his back. It's just something I figured out on my own. Kazuko's voice dropped as she pulled her hand back into herself and rubbed her wrist. Sad meant the class finally had time to work on the concert as a whole. Izuko joined the effects team in the dining room. They'd gotten a copy of the music sheet from Gyro who did them the favor of marking the key moments of the song where the effects would hit the best, like the chorus and the key change. They also brainstormed all the possible effects they could do. Of course, the shining centerpiece shall be moi. Ayama made sure that was clear. Yeah, but we gotta have some more colorful stuff, too. It would be so cool if you could use your fire for pyrotechnics, Todoroki. Kirishima suggested. 
I don't think that would be very safe, though, Todoroki said. If it's too crowded, someone might get hurt. My eyes should be okay as long as I don't make anything too big and heavy. Ashido already suggested you use your quirk to chip away at my eyes. We do want effects that will cover the whole auditorium, so that the people in the back won't feel left out and leave. Izuko added, if we need to cover more ground, maybe I could ask some of the birds and squirrels on campus to help. Kota Koji said, he was normally very shy and didn't speak up much in class. That's why the effects team was the perfect place for him. He could help the concert from the shadows while still utilizing his talents. Hey, yeah, like carrying ropes and stuff. Siro agreed with him wholeheartedly. Boo, let's ask Yamomo if she can make some party cannons for us. Kirishima exclaimed. If we use them sparingly, that could be good. We don't want to be too distracting or else it'll throw off the music, Todoroki said. Also, Mina suggested that Achako use her quirk to make us float above the crowd. But it would be awesome if she made some of the audience float, too. Hiroshima kept going with a lot of exciting ideas. He had essentially made himself the leader of the effects team when it came to the brainstorming. Siro and Todoroki had to reel him in sometimes when his ideas got too crazy. Eventually, after a couple of hours, the effects team had a checklist of possible effects that the other teams could accept or deny. These are all such great ideas. I'll go see what the dance team has to say. Izuko said as she took the copies from the printer. She carried them outside where the dance squad was practicing out on the grass in their sweats. Mina coached them with an iron fist, shouting and clapping the rhythm for the rest to follow. She swung around and shifted her shoulders and arms smoothly. Ada, loosen up. Just because it's called a lock doesn't mean you have to be so rigid. Mina instructed, get that body moving, and then end it with a pop. Izuko watched from the front steps without interrupting. Mina moved around so easily. It must have taken years to get that good. Achako and Tsuyu were doing well. Their quirks required a lot of movement on their part, so they were already leagues ahead of her in terms of grace. While Izuko was given the choice to join the dance team, she opted out because she didn't want to be seen on a stage right now. But she still wanted to learn how to dance. She wished that she could join them in their practice sessions just for herself. Maybe some other time. Then, she noticed something rustling around in the bushes. Did someone come to sneak up on them? She looked past the dance team and moved around to see some blonde hair sticking out from the top. She got closer until she finally recognized them. Hey, Tagata. She called out with a happy smile as she waved at him. What are you doing in there? Her spotting him got everyone's attention, which unbeknownst to her, ruined the element of surprise he was going for. But since it was Midoriya, he didn't mind that much. Even though his cover was blown, he decided to continue his gag anyway. He stuck his butt out from the bush while their surprise guest appeared from behind the bush entirely. Ari, the work-study girls cheered as they spotted her in a cute new red dress. Izuko dropped her papers and ran over to pick her up. Hi, Izuko. Ari greeted her quietly as she was taken into her arms. She already looked so much better than when she last saw her. Her cheeks were fuller and rose-tinted, like she had finally been eating properly. Her clean hair looked brushed and shiny. That dress looks great on you. Sue commented on the red overall dress with white lining inside the pleated skirt. She also had a small little messenger bag strapped across her chest. You are so precious. Achako cooed at her while Izuko was holding her. Hey guys, I brought a peach for ya. Mirio said as he bounced his ass in the bush. Clearly, he was making do with anything that resembled permeation. Wait, don't tell me you've got a secret kid. Ajiro said to Mirio. The rest of the class had been left in the dark about the details of the Shai Hasekai raid. So when their upperclassmen showed up with a little girl, it threw them for a loop. Mirio made no comment on the matter. In fact, the thought of everyone thinking he was a teen father was hilarious to him. So he crawled out of the bush smiling without denying it. Midoriya, Aizawa got Izuko's attention. Tagata and I finally got permission from the principal. But he was worried that this whole new environment would be too much for her. So, to avoid additional stress, we're letting Iri explore the campus before the festival. Hello, you must be Iri, from the work study. Very nice to meet you, I'm Ida. Ida came over and introduced himself. Minta, hey there. Minta also introduced himself. Man, you're gonna be a looker, aren't ya? Izuko kicked him back with her foot as Iri hid herself nervously in Izuko's shirt collar. Huh? Yeah. She's kind of shy. Mirio stood next to Izuko so he could pat Iri's back. Izuko, you think you can help me give Iri a tour of the school? I want to show her as much as we can so she can see what we do here. Yeah, I'd love to. Just let me check with my Izuko answered. But then her team captain came out the door. Midoriya. What did the dance team say about the hey, it's Iri? As soon as he saw her, Kirishima rushed out to see the little girl as well. Oh wait, we were never actually introduced, were we? Oh, the effects sheet. Izuko suddenly remembered what she'd come out to do and saw that the papers were scattered throughout the grass. She handed Iri over to Mirio to collect them. Kirishima, do you mind if I duck out of the meeting a little early? There's something else I got to do today. No problem. 
While you were gone, we got a bunch of new ideas we wanted to add, so that checklist is already outdated. Besides, it was time for a break, anyway. Kirishima told her without worrying. Thank you so much. Izuko handed him the crumpled old papers and bowed before returning to join Mirio and Iri. Izuko and Mirio each took one of Iri's hands as they walked through the school hallways. At first, Izuko was nervous to walk among the other students. She was so excited to hang out with Iri and Mirio that for a moment she forgot that she was somewhat famous among the student pie. But as they showed Iri throughout the hallways, no one seemed bothered enough to give a second glance. It may be the weekend, but since the students live here in the dorms, there are still a ton of people running around campus helping to prepare for the festival. Mirio explained to Iri so that she wouldn't be confused or scared of the large number of students in the hallway. It also gave Izuko some comfort, too. It meant that everyone was so busy with their own class projects that they didn't care about the infamous villain girl anymore. Thankfully, it looked like she was becoming old news. They encountered some more students who were more shocked to see that Mirio had a kid with him. Whoa, who's that? Don't tell me your temporary leave from school is because you have a kid now. As before when Ajiro asked the same thing, Mirio refused to answer and just smiled, letting others believe what they wanted to believe. That made his classmates nervous that it was true. Izuko had to admit, the way they were panicking was pretty funny, and she felt a hint of deja vu. She remembered the sports festival, and when Todoroki cornered her before their match, she was so intimidated by him, and then he asked, and that just made Izuko laugh in her palm. Back then, she was panicking, but now she could see just how hilarious it was. She laughed even harder and had to wipe a tear from her eye. It distracted Iri and Mirio, who just looked at her curiously at first. Wow, I don't know if I've ever heard you laugh like that before. Mirio cheered as Iri tilted her little hat. I'm sorry, I just remembered something really funny my friend told me once. She tried to explain. No, don't apologize. You have such a cute laugh, Mirio said. But what did they say that got you laughing like that? Um, well the fact that your classmates think that Iri is your daughter reminded me of when I used my quirk at the sports festival. Fizuko tried to explain it in a way that didn't ruin the joke. Todoroki, you remember him, right? Yeah, the one with red and white hair that cuts right in the middle? Scar on his face. Mirio asked. Yeah, him. He's always so serious. I mean, he has a good reason but... Fizuko shook her head as she was getting away from the point. Anyway, after he saw me use my power quirk, he took me aside in the hallway and he asked me, with dead serious eyes. Fizuko tried to get into character and dropped into a scowling expression, looking straight at Mirio, Midoriya. Are you All Might's secret love child, or something? Mirio laughed so hard he dropped to his knees without letting go of Iri's hand. Iri didn't even know who All Might was, so the joke was lost on her. She just watched Mirio collapse on the floor in hysterics, or something. Mirio repeated his favorite part. Yes, that's exactly what he said. Izuko said, still chuckling. I just can't believe. Mirio slowly picked himself back up while trying to contain himself. That you get asked that, too. Too. Izuko widened her eyes. I know, right. When I was a first year, someone even started a rumor that I was All Might's son. It didn't die down until my real dad came for parents' day. Mirio explained. Well, I can see why. You're tall, muscular, blonde, you have blue eyes. Izuko added. But if you're his secret love child, and I'm his secret love child. Oh, oh that would make us brother and sister. Mirio said. Izuko looked at him as he held Iri's tiny hand in his. You would make a great big brother, Tagata. Haha, <laughs> you think so? Mirio's voice got a little quieter, I don't know. As they walked outside to show Iri more of the grounds, they picked up their arms to let Iri swing between them. Mirio quietly thought to himself, I don't want you to see me as a brother, Midoriya. Together, Mirio and Izuko walked with Iri around outside so they could see the larger decorations people were making for their outdoor events. The background was filled with the rhythmic hammering of nails as students constructed their booths for foods, games, and other fun activities. Izuko could even spot the construction of an obstacle course in the grass. There were so many loud noises that both Mirio and Izuko peeked at Iri occasionally to make sure she was handling it well. Everyone's been super busy even though it's still a month away. Izuko explained. Oh, Def, you gotta try and outdo last year, Mirio said. And it takes a lot of work to pull off something plus ultra. Suddenly, a large dragon skull burst out in front of them, scaring Iri and Izuko back a few feet. Sorry, Tetsu Tetsu from Class 1B exclaimed as he pulled back the paper mash head that his class's tech team had crafted. When he noticed who it was, he looked stunned, Midoriya, from Class A. No way, the prodigal daughter of Yue herself. Another voice which crawled up Izuko's skin declared from the back of the dragon as he moved himself up to the front, back from the depths of hell. Dude, be cool. Tetsu Tetsu tried to warn him. Ake. Izuko shrieked quietly once she realized they'd also run into Monoma. 
who always had something bold to say, usually at Class 1A's expense. Now that she had given him high levels of fuel for the fire, she tried to evade his sharp tongue by focusing on Iri instead asking her tenderly, Iri, are you okay? I thought it was that dragon from before, Iri said in her little voice. You saw a dragon. Bazuko needed a moment to think about where she could have possibly seen that before she remembered. Oh, you're talking about Ryukyu. Aha, I see you trying to ignore me. Monoma cut in. Well excuse me, your majesty, there's no need to be so cold. I was only going to mention how I heard Class 1A is going to do a concert for everyone. That's so cute. Not that it'll be able to compete with Class B's performance which will make you wish you hadn't even shown up. We're doing Romeo and Juliet in The Prisoner of Azkaban, The Return of the King. It's a completely original play written by us, a super spectacular fantasy epic. While Izuko's eyes had dilated on being called Majesty. Her anxious heart calmed down when she realized that Monoma just wanted to brag about their play. He didn't have any harsh words for her today, at least not in front of other people. Bring a hanky to wipe the tears from your eyes when you realize how superior we are. Monoma shouted and burst into mad laughter that made everyone question his sanity. He certainly wasn't making a good first impression on Eri. That was for sure. Izuko turned her away and covered her eyes so she wouldn't get scared. Suddenly, he was struck in the back of the head with a wooden plank by his classmate, Oase, that knocked him completely unconscious. Sorry about that, Midoriya. You okay? Oase asked her specifically. No, don't worry about me. I think you gave him a concussion. Izuko nervously giggled to lighten the mood again. Kendo isn't around right now, so it's up to me to keep him in line. Oase explained as he picked him up and put him over his shoulder. Really, those two usually show up as a set. Izuko said as she looked around and realized that Kendo wasn't anywhere to be seen even though her quirk of big fist would be very helpful for set construction. Well, she's off prepping for the beauty pageant right now, so. Oase said. Hey, beauty. What? Izuko was taken aback. She didn't even realize Yue had one of those. It's kind of funny. She didn't even mean to enter. Oase added before he left. Monoma still had a point, though. We're pulling out all the stops. Hope you can come out to see it. Tetsu Tetsu said before he too turned away to leave with his classmate. When they were clear of the others, Oase asked Tetsu Tetsu quietly. He didn't say anything that crossed a line, did he? You know, I'm not actually sure, Tetsu Tetsu answered. Since sometimes Monoma's hardest jabs were the ones that took a moment to think about, Monoma just released an elegant chuckle as he stood in front of his classmates. He brushed his hair out of his face as he lowered his voice to a more serious tone. Do you two really think so lowly of me? I know I've been uncouth in the past, but I'm not that cruel. Izuko still stood where the class 1B boys left her, unsure how to feel. She felt like she had flinched hard when no one had even thrown a real punch. When she saw Monoma, she expected a little more bite. No, she wasn't actually feeling disappointed, was she? Because if even Monoma couldn't make a smart-ass comment to her face, then he was pitying her, which she didn't want anymore. But she didn't want to be called the villain queen, either. Especially in front of Iri. Sorry about that, Iri. You too, okay. Mirio asked, putting a hand on each of their shoulders, I think you handled that rather well. UAS pretty great, but every place has its dark side, I guess. Izuko put that all aside and focused on the last thing Oase mentioned. Mr. Aizawa didn't say anything about there being some kind of beauty pageant. You sound disappointed, Midoriya, Mirio said, picking up Iri in his arms. It's too late to enter now, but maybe you could enter next year. There he went again, saying something embarrassing to make Izuko blush because clearly he found it amusing. She deeply inhaled as her cheeks burned red and she turned away to deny him the satisfaction of her shocked expression. That's very funny, Tagata. Izuko muttered and kept walking as they had planned. Funny? Did you think I was joking? Mirio smiled as he took her hand in his so she didn't go too far ahead. You're a beautiful girl, Midoriya. And talented, too. You could totally be a contender. You don't just say stuff like that. Izuko grew more flustered. I was just bringing it up because I thought Yeirazu should have been able to compete. Not me. If you say so, but I still think you could do it. Mirio laughed. But this year, I'm betting all my chips on the girl who's gunning for it the most. Who? Izuko asked. Come on, I'll show ya. He pulled her towards the school inside while Iri still rode on his other arm. Last year's runner-up. The big three seconds best girl, Nejire Hado. They walked back through the halls that were designated for the pageant contestants. The air was polluted with hairspray and discarded shoes lined the walls. Beautiful shiny dresses sat hooked onto racks next to vanities that had makeup scattered everywhere. Nejire floated in the air, posed as if she was lounging on a long couch. Her long blue dress exposed her shoulders and cleavage before flowing out to a sheer layer, like a thin row. It ran down her long legs which were ornamented with gold anklets and sea blue pumps. When they came in to greet her, she automatically noticed their special visitor. Hey, hey, what's Ari doing here? Nejire asked in her childish tone as she floated down. Hey girls, why you here? 
For funsies, in the back, Nejire's best friend and attendant, Yu Yuheya, discussed which outfits their shining star would look best in. Izuko could overhear their discussion. While Nejire's physique was womanly and sexy, her persona was more cutesy and playful, and they lost points last year because her outfit didn't match who she was. You look amazing, Hato. Izuko admired her with stars in her eyes, with your flashy quirk and your kindness and your... your... BBB balance, Mirio suggested. How were you only the runner-up? Izuko asked. Yeah, listen to this, Hato said like she was gossiping. Every year, I lose to the same girl. She's just too amazing. The Beauty Pageant Queen by Bimi Kenranzaki from Support Course Class 3G. This year's pageant is stacked. Tamaki Amajiki emerged from the corner of the room. Kendo's gained some underground fans thanks to that commercial, so she's a real contender. And of course Hato won't be holding back. Just thinking about performing in front of all those people. Imagining it makes me nauseous. Amajiki, who was otherwise the brave hero in training Sun Eater, curled up and clutched his stomach since he had already psyched himself out at the thought of being in the spotlight. Watching him was making Izuko feel nervous by proxy, since she was helping do a stage show, too. At first I only entered because Yu Yu told me to, but it turns out, it's a lot of fun. Nejire held onto her friend's shoulders, I wanna crush it. That's why this year, I'll definitely come in first. It's my last chance. You can do it. Mirio declared with a pumped fist. Though the stakes were high, Nejire was smiling with excitement and hope, not letting the pressure damper her joy. She was the kind of girl these competitions were made for. Ah, uh, I see. I think I'm starting to get it. Izuko thought out loud. Pageantry is more than just having a beautiful face and body. You have to capture the very essence of yourself and create a look to match it. Yue allowed this competition not just for fun for the girls, but because pageantry is key to a hero's success in the billboard charts. Like, once All Might decided on his Americanized style for his hero look, he had to make everything else match, from his costumes to his attack move names. That's part of why he's so iconic. It always comes back to All Might with you, doesn't it? Mirio rubbed the back of his head and laughed. PSSSSDT. Hey Mirio. PSSSDTT. PSSSSDTT. Hato whispered loudly with no subtlety whatsoever as she floated towards his ear. I'm right here, Nejire. You can just talk to me. Mirio told her. Did you finally ask her O-U-T? Nejire whispered a little quieter. But Izuko was still clearly in listening range. Is this a deity? Eh, what are you even asking, Nejire? Mirio tried to play dumb. You know I'm bad at spelling, so I have no idea what that means. Both Izuko and Uri blinked. And oh, I think I'm gonna be sick. Tamaki felt the tension grind in his stomach and covered his mouth. Okay, well this was fun, you guys. But we should be moving on now. There's still a lot to show Uri here. Mirio grabbed his girl's hands and quickly pulled them away. You know what'll be fun. The support course. You'll love it, Uri. I actually think Midoriya knows more about it than me. See you later guys. As soon as Mirio disappeared into the hallway with his little tour group, Tamaki uncovered his face and looked at Nejire. He was taking his time, Hato. You said you weren't going to interfere. He would have been reprimanding her if his voice could actually reach a scolding tone. Awa, but I couldn't help it. They looked so cute together, like a little family. Nejire whined. Besides, it's been months already. I can't wait much longer. I want him to at least confess before graduation. That's still seasons away. It's not that simple with her, and you know that. Tamaki said, pulling his hair behind his elf-shaped ear. MMM. Nejire thought about it, and then reminded herself of something. Oh shoot. I forgot I was gonna congratulate her for not being pregnant. Ugh. Now I know I'm gonna be sick. Tamaki's face turned green as he looked for the nearest waste bin. Now why are you sick, Amajiki? Are you pregnant instead? The support course was arguably the most hyped for the cultural festival out of all the classes. All the grades are working together to put on an extra awesome exhibition of their work. Mirio had to shout to be heard over the loud drilling and hammering. Nezuko was already stunned by the cool robots, jetpacks, and mecha suits the students were putting together. I can't wait to see. I hear it's a highlight every year. Nezuko squeezed her fists and bounced on her feet. Yes, the school festival is the support course's time to shine. A familiar voice popped up from behind her. Hatsum, Izuko cheered and hugged her friend. Behind her shoulder, she could see the large mecha suit that Hatsum had designed. Wait, whoa, that's my super cute baby no. 202, May proudly declared. Haha, oh, I think you might have some grease on you. Izuko pulled away and looked at the black streaks on May's arms and face. Looks like you got a little on you, too. Mirio pointed out, as some of the grime had rubbed off on Izuko's jacket during the hug. Yeah, I'm filthy, but I can't waste time bathing. May laughed as she ran her hands through her hair. Even though we showed off some items at the sports festival, we took a backseat to the heroes. But this time the contraptions that we've come up with will be given the spotlight they deserve. Which means a lot of big companies and buyers can get up close and personal with my work. 
I need to make sure they're perfect so they don't embarrass me. Kazuko grew more excited when she listened to her friends talk about their plans. This cultural festival wasn't just important to help students relax, but also to make a show of their hard work. How did the Iron Souls work out for you, by the way? They asked. They've been great for training, though I haven't gotten to use them in an actual fight yet. Kazuko said. If there's anything else you need, please let me know. Mei said. She loved making gear for her so much, it was more of a favor to Mei than it was to Izuko. Of course, I.W. Izuko got distracted by the sizzling and hissing coming from inside Mei's baby. There was a loud popping noise as the shielding to the cockpit blew off its hinges. A small fire started in the seat. Ah, baby, Mei cried out. Not again, Hatsu. One of her exasperated classmates groaned as he looked for the fire extinguisher. That was Izuko and Mirio's cue to leave. Sorry, we should run. Don't worry, Iri, Izuko said as she took Iri's shoulders and guided her out the door. Okay, Iri muttered as she peeked over her shoulder to watch the smoke cloud grow. They took her to the cafeteria for a well-deserved lunch break. Izuko got Iri a juicy drink from the soda fountain as they all sat together at one of the lunch tables. Welp, that's pretty much all of you, eh? Mirio said, as he couldn't think of anything else they needed to show her. Yeah, that's right. So, what do you think of our school, Iri? Izuko leaned her head into her palm. She knew that the tour hadn't gone completely as they expected, but surely there were some good parts along with the scary parts. I, um, I'm not sure, Iri said quietly as she sipped her drink. Izuko and Mirio looked at each other awkwardly, with her biting her lip and him quietly laughing in embarrassment. But, I can see how hard everyone is working on the festival, and I do want to know how it all turns out, Iri said, which brightened the teens' faces right up. So this day was a success after all. It sounds like our special visitor is getting excited. Principal Nezu commented from one table over, where he was enjoying his lunch of a hearty cheese block with Midnight, who had gotten the curry. Ah, hello Principal Nezu. Miss Midnight. Izuko greeted them politely as the principal chowed down on his cheese like a typical mouse. It seems like we made the right choice. He said as he wiped his face, you know what? I'm excited for everything, too. I love seeing so many students joining together and having fun, all in the hope that their peers will have a good time. Now, if we could just get the police to understand that. M.S. Midnight commented somewhat bitterly. Now, now, Kayama. Principal Nezu addressed her less formally and patted her shoulder before walking away. Anyway, I hope your heart bursts with happiness when the day rolls around. Midnight shortly after followed him and gave a quick note to their students. I'll spare you all the gory details, but the principal fought hard for you all. As a result, security will be heavier than in past years. Just know, if an alarm sounds, even if it's a false one, we'll have to shut down and evacuate. Those were the terms the police agreed upon. Not strict, Izuko said, but she knew why. Another reminder that there was still a big target on her back. It was a miracle that she was still allowed to attend UA at all. Then again, she wasn't the only one the League could target. The League of Villains had it out for all hero schools, not just UA. And if they had made it into this school twice before... Then who was to say they wouldn't do it again on that special day? The silver lining was that Shigaraki's obsession with her had made him reckless last time. Although, she doubted she'd get so lucky again. Of course, to keep that from happening, we're also beefing up our defensive measures. Midnight said to assure them. We even let Hound Dog off his leash to patrol. Mr. Hound Dog's on patrol, Kazuko said. She'd actually made use of his counseling services when she first came back, so she'd gotten to see him when he was calm and friendly. That made it jarring to imagine him skulking around the campus like a wolf on the hunt. Oh, and did you know that Class A's performance is causing quite a stir in the faculty lounge? You'd better make it pleasurable. Midnight teased as she carried her lunch tray away. Right, of course, Izuko said. Deku, what performance? Yuri asked. We're doing a big live concert for everyone. She explained. Wow, cool. So are you gonna show us your killer moves on that stage, Midoriya? Mirio asked with a cheeky bite of his tongue. Well, actually, I'm on the effects team. So I'll be working behind the scenes the whole time, Izuko said, noticing the small drop in his enthusiasm, but I'll be helping show off some really cool effects, and the dance team we have is great. MMM, Harry nodded in understanding, but Izuko could hear the slight disappointment in her voice, too. Jeez, how badly did Iri and Tagata want to see her dance? If they knew that she wasn't very good, they'd realize they weren't missing much. As she looked down, she caught a glimpse of the time on her watch. Ah, sorry you guys. Looks like my break's over. She stood up from the table and patted Iri's head. I'd be honored if you came to our show, Iri. We're trying really hard to make it fun for you and everyone else. You can bet that I'll be there. I'll even come look for you backstage if I have to. Mirio said. As she walked back to her dorm, she saw the dance team still rehearsing in the grass. Had they taken a single break since she left? She slowed her pace on the sidewalk to watch them run through the routine once more. Peering at their movements, she tried to memorize every position. When Mina gave the order to take it from the top, 
Izuko backed herself up where she thought she wouldn't be seen and tried to follow along with the dance. Side step, left hook. Side step, right hook. Two, four, six, eight. Spin, left, right. Point, Midoriya. Are you trying to switch to the dance team? Todoroki suddenly appeared from behind her, which made her wail in fright. Ah, uh, Todoroki, don't scare me like that. She whimpered as she gathered her bearings. Sorry, I just noticed you were copying the routine. Did you want to dance instead of do effects? Todoroki asked. He was always so straight to the point. And no. Well, Izuko grabbed a strand of her hand and twirled it between her fingers. I mean, I just think it would be fun. But I already chose the effects team, so it would be irresponsible to switch now. I'm sure we could work around it if you wanted to switch. Or maybe, there's a way you could do both. Todoroki offered the most obvious solutions. I don't think so, Todoroki. I chose effects for a reason. Izuko averted her gaze from him. I'm not ready to be in the spotlight, seen by so many people. Not with my reputation. Which reputation is that? Todoroki asked bluntly. Izuko tensed her shoulders. Was he being facetious or was he just that dense? Come on, you know. Izuko clutched her arms. Are you talking about people thinking you're a villain? Anyone who knows you would see that isn't true. Todoroki assured her. But not everyone knows me, Todoroki. Not like you do, Izuko said, her voice growing sadder. Did someone say something to you? Did someone call you a villain? Todoroki's tone also changed, like he was suddenly defensive. No, no one said anything. Not even Monoma. But they don't have to. I can just feel it. Izuko said. I'm sorry. I wish I could make you feel better. Todoroki said. Comforting words were not his strong suit. And he knew it. He knew she was upset. But he didn't see how he could fix it like he wanted to. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. Izuko smiled. The last thing she wanted was for one of her bad moods to spread to her friends. If it means anything. I think you could pick up the dance really quickly. Shoto said. No way. I've never danced before. I'd be starting from a beginner's level. It'd take me forever to learn all the steps. Izuko denied it. But dancing is kind of like fighting, and you pick up new fighting moves quickly. You tend to pick up something and improve really fast once you care about it. Shoto tried to encourage her. Well, maybe I'll learn to dance some other time, after the festival. I'm sure I'll get another chance. Izuko conceded that much. I'd like to see that very much. Shoto said, a blush escaping on his cheeks as he imagined her as a stunning little ballerina under a shining spotlight. And another thing, about your reputation. No matter what you do, to me you'll always be the girl who never gives up, ever, on anything. Izuko's eyes watered. She didn't know that Todoroki thought so highly of her. Now she couldn't help but smile, a real smile this time. Come on. She grabbed his hand and continued her way to the dorm lobby. I think the rest of the effects team is wondering what's taking so long. That night, as Izuko lay in bed, she counted on her fingers how many days they had left until the festival. Over a week, the effects team still had plenty of muscle to move things around even if she suddenly left it, and the dance team had pretty much solidified their routine. Every time she saw on TV that All Might had a new attack, it only took her on average of an hour to master the movements. So, hypothetically, if Izuko started practicing now, she could have the dance down within a few days. While she told Todoroki she had been worried about what the rest of the students thought of her, she had to remind herself that she had walked through the whole school today, encountering many of the different classes, and no one had said anything. And while she had felt eyes on her before, she didn't feel them as badly today. Also, Todoroki had a point. She had never been the type to give up, even under the worst of peer pressure. She didn't let it stop her when she was quirkless, so why should she let it get to her now? She was still going to be a hero after all, in spite of everything that came before. How could she hope to become the number one hero and All Might's successor if she was scared of the spotlight now? If she backed down now, it was like admitting that the villains had successfully broken her. That was the last thing she wanted. And Iri, Iri wanted to see her dance. She jumped out of bed and started practicing the routine from memory. I'm sorry, Midoriya, but we really need you for this trick. Hiroshima explained, We don't have a fly system in the gym, so if we want to move Ayama around the crowd, we need you to use your strength to move him by hand across the railing. Does it have to be me, though? You're really strong, too. Izuko didn't want to sound like she was complaining, but she was disappointed at her request to switch being softly denied. I would, but I'm going to be busy chopping off chips from Todoroki's ice block. Kirishima explained. Todoroki looked on in embarrassment and disappointment. He was the one who had gotten her hopes up that she could switch, but he didn't know about this new stunt when he encouraged her to ask. Ah, uh, I guess you're right. Izuko nodded politely. I'm really sorry. It would have been cool to see you dance, too. Kirishima said sympathetically. No, don't be sorry. Izuko smiled to lighten the mood. It was just an idea I wanted to try. I chose the effects team, so effects it is. Besides, that stunt sounds really cool. I'd love to make Ayama shine across the whole gym. Yeah, it's gonna look awesome. Since the initial shock of him being a disco ball would wear off quickly, 
pulling him all over the audience will keep it interesting. Hiroshima explained in better detail to make it clear why it was so important. Izuko promised she would do her duty to make the show as great as possible. At least she hadn't promised Uri that she would dance. That would have made this more disappointing. Still, maybe there was some way to compromise. She'd have to brainstorm on it later. Right now, they had to practice this new trick. If Izuko pulled too hard, she could accidentally swing Ayama into the wall. She also had scheduled private training with All Might. They met in their new usual practice grounds in the forest. She'd already impressed him with her new wind attack, which she was going to name Air Force, but she needed to practice controlling it so that she didn't blow away everything in its path. That required a delicate movement of her fingers, which was difficult when one for all was activated. She tried to aim her wind at a specific branch on a specific tree. If this worked, it could be as precise as Kakin's AP shot. She threw her hand out with a soft twirl of her wrist and a small jerk of her fingers. The wind that rushed out rustled the whole tree, shaking an abundance of leaves out of it. Damn it, I'm still pretty rusty. I don't remember ever having to use this much control. Izuko groaned as she looked at her finger which was slightly red. Are there any tricks you use to get that much control? Sorry, I got nothing. All Might said as he offered an ice pack for her fingers. To be honest, I was able to use 100% of one for all pretty much right away. I can only reiterate the advice I gave you in the beginning. To create an image in your head. The egg in the microwave. Right, Hazuko said dejectedly. That was more helpful when she was static. But eggs didn't exactly have fingers to move around. Just keep working and focus on what it feels like when you're successful. And then just repeat those stierk. All Might broke out in a cough of blood. Oop, it's been a while since you did that. Izuko hid an amused smile behind her hand. Then, something came zooming their way, fast like a baseball. Izuko spotted the charging metal projectile from behind All Might's head. Ah, uh, watch out. Izuko reached out with her hand to catch it. But when it didn't quite reach, Black Whip shot out from her wrist without even a thought. Like an extension of her own hand, it grabbed the metal ball, which also has metallic flapping wings. Izuko was stunned that Black Whip came out at all. Not only that, it was maintaining itself as the tendril kept its grip on the ball. Whoopsie. The Hatsum came running up, chasing after her baby, but nice catch. Hatsum. W. What are you? Izuko's shock that someone had stumbled upon their secret practice spot made her lose focus and Black Whip swiftly dissipated back into thin air. All Might caught the ball before it could hit the ground. Sorry, sometimes I test my babies out here. She laughed casually as All Might handed it back to her. If it were anyone else, Izuko might be worried about being discovered here privately with him, but she knew Mei Hatsum. Her friend was too consumed in her own little world to notice the atmosphere around her. It could be bothersome at times, but at least it kept Mei out of gossip and hearsay. If it didn't have to do with the engineering and selling of her babies, Mei did not care. Thanks for snagging it. This sweetie's a mini third eye I'm working on. Mei explained the metal ball right away, as expected, but then she interjected herself, Oh yeah, Midoriya. About that item you wanted for your arms, I had a baby that could do something similar, so I'm rejiggering it right now. Once the application goes through, I'll get it to you right away. That's great, Izuko said, but then looked at her arm. If Black Whip was going to keep shooting out as it did just now, then she'd need even more adjustments to deal with it. Ah, but before you finish it, there's something else about my quirk that you should know, and you might have to add something for it. All right, I was hoping you would say that, May exclaimed, actually excited to have more work to do. However, as they talked, her third eye flew away in the other direction, which caught May's attention. Ah, text me the details later. Where are you going, baby? Wait for mama. Thanks, you're the best, Hatsum. Izuko called out as May ran away, chasing after her flying precious one. You two seem to get along well. All Might commented, pleased to see that Izuko had such a good circle of friends. So, a new item, huh? Yup, Izuko nodded. Not only could it help brace my arms, but it could help harness this wind pressure move. And now I think it could do something for Black Whip, too. Yeah, I was about to say, I didn't realize you had started training it. All Might commented, I, I haven't, actually. It just sort of moved on its own. Izuko confessed, looking at her wrist, but it looked a lot better than before. And a lot less dangerous. If I could control it like that, it could be great for grabbing things without actually using my hands. If you think you're ready for it, I say go for it. Better sooner than later. All Might reassured her. But about that item, I tried something like that in the past. You, a support item. Izuko asked in shock. Her fangirl side bursting at the reveal, like she had just found a missing vital piece of her collection. How did I not know that? Well, yeah, but it was too bulky to be functional, even though it was designed to use only 20 minus 30% of my power. It would have been fine if I only used mid to long range attacks for the most part, but since I was more of a short range brawler, I kept breaking it. All Might explained, trying to downplay the gear to be not nearly as impressive as Izuko imagined it was. Its usefulness didn't matter to her, though. 
She was already imagining the coolest action figure of him with this long-lost support item. All Might bulked up to his muscle form to continue his point. I got rid of the tech and carried on with nothing but my own strapping body. It didn't last however, and he quickly shrunk back down to his skinny size. That being said, reinforcing your power with new gear could be smart. Just make sure you don't rely on it too much. Some people aren't able to hold their own after losing an item. I've seen way too many heroes fall into that trap. Right, Azuko nodded, listening to him as intently as she did when she first became his pupil. Now, how about we put the wind pressure move aside for a bit and see if you can shoot out Black Whip again? When the day came to an end, all the students gathered in the dorm lobby, still buzzing with the excitement of their progress. The band argued about the tempos and keeping the beat, so Yamomo calmed them down by making some of her special tea, the rare gold tips imperial. The aromatic tea carried across the lobby and even reached Azuko on the couch who was preoccupied with what she considered a matter of great importance. All Might had an item. All Might had an item. All Might had an item. I'm such a failure for not knowing about it. She muttered madly as she scanned through tap. Tube on her phone. Surely someone got footage of it at some point. She really should have pressed All Might for more details. What years did he use it? What color was it? Did David Shield make it? Did he have it stashed away somewhere? She just wanted to know everything about it. Hey Azuko, do you want a cup of the tea Yamomo just made? Achako offered, but it wasn't enough to break her attention. As she scrolled, her finger accidentally tapped one of the videos and it started to play. Coincidentally, it was a video about tea, so Achako watched it alongside her. On the screen was Gentle Criminal, a small name that Azuko only knew vaguely about. In the video, he talked about how he was currently drinking royal flush tea, but his next video would be an alarm to all of society. The teaser ended, and Achako commented on how short it was. Gentle, Izuko muttered. Do you know him? People don't seem to like him very much. Achako asked, noticing the high dislike-to-like ratio. No, I never met him. He's technically a villain, but he just does petty crimes and records it. It's kind of weird that he'd been doing these videos for years but hasn't been caught. I guess the police are worrying about bigger threats now, so I doubt anyone will stop him anytime soon. I kind of wonder what he's planning next. Izuko answered. The league had never mentioned him once, not even when they were trying to recruit more people. He just didn't fit the bill of what they were looking for. He wasn't violent at all, just a nuisance seeking attention. But his warning that his next video would alarm society worried her. Was he stepping up his act? Would he become dangerous? That worried her. With the league getting so much attention, she saw how other criminals were starting to step up their game. Was Gentle Criminal one of those, too? She took a deep breath. Maybe she was just being paranoid again. Gentle seemed to be one of those vloggers who recorded absolutely everything. If he tried broadcasting anything near the league's level, the heroes and police would certainly nab him. She set her phone aside and finally served herself a cup of gold tips imperial. Gentle criminal was one of the last things she should be concerned about. She still wanted to find footage of All Might's special item. And more importantly, she felt like she had reached a breakthrough with Black Whip today. Practicing with All Might helped her get better control of it and now she was able to send it out from her wrist and capture something at mid-range. Long range would take more time, but now she was able to hold things with it, and it wasn't sharp or dangerous at all. Based on what the previous user had told her about controlling it with her emotions, she could use it safely as long as she kept her mood in check. All Might had even allowed her to use it on him. He was also curious to know what it felt like to be in Blackwood's grip, so she extended it around his arm. According to him, it didn't really have any texture, it just felt like getting held by an intangible force. She also tried to use it on the tree branches, but found it to be very slippery since it had no real traction. To fully grasp something, she had to wrap around it at several points, otherwise it would just slide. With a big slurp of the delicious tea, Izuko felt a light bulb go off in her head. I got it. She jumped up, as she was hit with inspiration. She looked over at Ayama who was also enjoying the tea with his pinky held up as he pulled the cup from the saucer. Ayama, come to the auditorium with me. I want to try something. Azuko didn't give details. She just grabbed Ayama's hand and pulled him with her, Kirishima. Shodo, you guys, too. Bring the whole team if you can. If this works, we might not even need a rope to carry our disco ball. After many weeks of hard work and last-minute changes, the day of the festival was finally approaching. All the decorations were set up in the gym, and they just needed to do a final run-through before they could call it in for the night. So Mina, who had carried the role of the tough-as-nails dance instructor for weeks, put on her stern face and clapped loudly. Look alive. She ordered in one, and two, and three, and one and two and three, and pose. Now it was time for Ayama to become a disco ball, but it was just practice, so he didn't light up today. He had to save his energy for the big day. Still, this was Izuko's late added trick, so they had to make sure that it worked. Together, the two headed up to the center railing towards the ceiling. Ready? Izuko asked, holding her hand out. 
Go for it, mon cher. Ayama proudly held his arms up. On cue, Izuko released Black Whip from her arm which wrapped securely around his body harness. There was enough distance between them where the vector could hang loose. In dot 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 go, Izuko called out, side by side. They both ran along the metal raining, picking up momentum, and then once they passed the stage, they jumped off each side. The frictionless Black Whip slid alongside the railing while the two countered each other's weight. And with a twirl from each person, the tendrils came back and twisted around each other, spinning each person as they slid across the gym. Once they reached the back, Izuko used a powerful kick to send them back towards the stage. Enough practice had shown her how much force to use to get them back to where they started. Once they made a full round, Black Whip retracted back into Izuko's arm, and the two would gracefully fall back down on the stage into a pose. Wow, that looked really cool. The rest of the effects team cheered them on. Thanks, you guys. Izuko blushed and turned to Ayama. Thanks for agreeing to do that with me. I know it seemed dangerous at first. Anything for the show. Ayama twinkled with a grin. Hey, it's already 9 o'clock. Students should have cleared out of the gym already. Hound Dog burst through the door and barked at the class, first figuratively and then literally. So they quickly scattered and headed back to their dorm rooms to rest up. So when were you gonna tell us about your second quirk, Midoriya? Mina asked on the way. Um, it's not really a second quirk. It's more like an extension of the one I have. Izuko found it hard to explain, since on paper, her quirk was labeled as power. Ow is so cool. That would be awesome if my quirk evolved like that, Minda said. Like what if my balls weren't just sticky on their own but they could shoot out sticky juice when you squeeze them, too? That sounds really gross when you say it. Jiru commented. Izuko lay in her bed forcing her eyes closed, trying to quiet her mind so she could sleep, but she was just so excited. She couldn't remember the last time she looked forward to something so fun. Their class had worked so hard. Their show was bound to be amazing. And even when that was done, the festival had so many fun activities to offer. Food, obstacle courses, games. And for Ari, it was going to be her first time doing all those things. That was the most important part of tomorrow, making Ari's day out magical. Mirio felt the same way. He was supposed to bring Ari to the show. And then once they were done, they were supposed to explore the festival together. They'd get her a candy apple and any other sweet treat she desired. And maybe, just maybe, she would smile for them. In the early morning, Izuko still made time for training with All Might before she had to get ready for the concert, especially since Black Whip was now incorporated into the show. She exercised it by swinging from tree branches like Tarzan. It took a lot of quick thinking to select the proper branches that wouldn't break. Plus she had to control the pull so that she didn't squeeze too hard. Like the base power of one for all, Black Whip could either be weaker or stronger based on her emotional state. As she was swinging, someone unexpected came running up to her and took her by surprise. Hey Midori ya! Yeah. May exclaimed as Izuko collided into her mid-swing and ended up carrying her and her growing grime cloud up with her. Uh, sorry, Hatsum. I didn't know you were out here again. Izuko retracted Black Whip and landed in the grass with her. She didn't want to comment on it, but May was even dirtier than last time. No problem. I was looking for you anyway. I knew you'd be out here training even though it's the big day. May stood up and handed her a special delivery. I got the gloves you asked for to work, so I came to give them to you in person. Uh, thank you, Hatsum. These look so cool. Izuko bounced up and down in excitement, though you could have waited until after the festival. I didn't want to rush you. Haha, <laughs> when it's over, I'm going to sleep for 36 hours. May boasted. Ah, uh, there you are. I see your support items done. Can I take a look? All Might asked. Of course. Izuko gladly handed them over to All Might for inspection, hoping to get his genuine opinion on it. He mused over the size of the gloves, and how they were not much bigger than regular winter gloves. When he heard that Izuko was getting an item, he expected a large bulky gauntlet that risked restricting her movements. But that wasn't the case here. Support items can be so compact these days, it's crazy. The gloves should also complement the rest of your costume, because you see, a good designer is able to satisfy the client in one go. So what do you think of them? May asked, awaiting her praise. I love them. Izuko slipped them on and noticed the outlets for controlling Black Whip. She tightly embraced May, her eyes filling with happy tears. Seriously, they're exactly what I needed right now. You're such a good friend, Hatsum. Wow, you like them that much, huh? May didn't know how to register the sudden affection. Once Izuko let her go, May handed her a booklet and scurried off. Anyway, here's the manual, see ya. Thanks again, and good luck today. Izuko called out to her and wiped the tear running down her cheek. Ah, uh, didn't expect to get so choked up this morning. It's alright. How about you break them in before the big show? All Might suggested. Right. Izuko clenched her fist and shot Black Whip out of the outlets in her new gloves. Once she felt she had gotten used to her gloves, she checked her phone and saw she still had some extra time before her class was supposed to meet up at the gym. Their performance was at 10am, so she had time to shower and change into her costume. 
She smiled as she walked past the colorful booths, and by the balloon arch at the front stood the plastic rack holding the pamphlet guides to all the cultural festival had to offer. She pulled one and scanned it as she kept moving, but came to a slow halt as she read over the food booths. Noodles, crepes, takoyaki dot 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 all these carnival treats, but no candy apples stand. Oh no, this wouldn't do. Not at all. Uri was expecting to try a candy apple. And if she wanted a candy apple, she was getting a candy apple. She checked her watch again. Maybe they had one at the grocery store. But the local grocery store didn't open until 9am, which is when they had to meet up at the gym. The convenience store was open by now, but there was no promise they'd have such a specific specialty food. If she couldn't buy a candy apple dot 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 she'd have to make one herself. She zoomed through the main gates of UA out to the city, with her phone in hand looking up easy recipes for candy apples. The audio played as she sprinted down the hill. The instructions seemed simple enough. To stem a regular-sized apple and stick a chopstick through the center. Then, mix copious amounts of sugar into water and boil it in a pan. Add red food coloring and blend until it makes a nice coating for the skewered apple. Allow time to cool down and it was all done. The perfect treat to brighten a special little girl's day. And all she needed was a single apple, a bag of sugar, and some red food coloring. Her red shoes skid along the concrete as she made a sharp turn into the convenience store. Selecting an apple was more time-consuming than she expected. It had to be the perfect shape, with no bruises or bumps. Once she found a nice round and symmetrical one, she checked it off the list and scurried to grab a bag of sugar. Now, all she needed was the food coloring. She thought it would be near the sugar, but unfortunately, this store only had a limited supply of baking ingredients. She stomped her foot in frustration and looked back at her watch. She was losing time quickly. How long would it take to check another store? Or would it only be available at the regular grocery store? If she checked another convenience store, she could be losing time for nothing. She went ahead and bought the ingredients she already had in her hand. And as the cashier rang up the sugar, she thought about how she didn't usually buy sugar herself because Sato usually had a bag in his room. Sato dot 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 of course, maybe he had food coloring. She ran with her bag of purchases as she dialed him up on her phone, holding it between her shoulder and ear. Hey Sato, quick question, do you have some red food coloring in your room I could borrow? She held her grocery bag tightly and rushed back up the hill. You do. That's great. Oh, I had to get some last-minute things. It was an emergency. No, everything's fine. I'm on my way back right now. Don't wait up for me. Bye. Azuko was so distracted by her phone conversation that she almost ran headfirst into a couple walking out of an older-looking building. Dear me. The gentleman exclaimed in the most posh voice she ever heard. Ah, uh, I'm so sorry. Azuko blushed in embarrassment, bowing repeatedly. Do be careful. You almost ruined the aftertaste of the gold tips imperial, a travesty I would not be able to ignore. The gentleman said in a familiar voice, Come on, let's go, let be. Honey, honey, oh yes, that's me. The small woman next to him giggled as they walked off. What a strange response. Also, hearing about the gold tips reminded her of that special tea Momo served them. Oh, if he had that tea then that building must be some kind of cafe. The Zuko thought out loud, which the gentleman heard and felt obligated to respond. Haha, you must be familiar with Gold Tips Imperial if you had this realization. You're obviously a lady of refined taste. Always a pleasure to meet a fellow connoisseur, even if you are just a young maiden. The man continued with as much excitement as she had whenever someone brought up All Might. Well, it's not me who knows that much, actually. My friend made that tea for us recently, that's all. She hated to burst his bubble, but she also had to hurry back to school, so she didn't have the time to chat anyway. Still, his voice was so achingly familiar that she wanted to keep talking to him until she recognized it. Oh, then you must definitely run in high-class circles. Er, I mean, you have a wise friend. The gentleman changed his words awkwardly, like he was hiding something. The way he talked to his companion was suspicious, too. Yes, I'm very lucky. She's my classmate, but she's also one of my good friends. She's helped me through so much, Izuko said, keeping the conversation going as she looked the man up and down. It was at the tip of her tongue. How delightful to hear, young lady. He said, now, if you'll pardon me. As he turned to leave, she finally realized it. That voice, the gentlemanly demeanor, and his expertise on tea. He had to be gentle criminal. He was probably about to commit another crime for his videos. That would also explain why he was wearing such a heavy coat and sunglasses. And the fact that he was walking out of a tea house close to Yue. After saying he was going to commit the crime of the century. Tell me something. She asked him, carrying a more serious tone. That tea was part of your ritual, right? No, this was bad. Unacceptable. Gentle criminal wasn't a violent or dangerous criminal. But he was threatening the one thing she needed to happen today. As Ms. Midnight said, if any intruders tried to come into the school grounds, even if it was a false alarm, the school would be forced to shut down the festival. That would ruin everyone's hard work and crushery's plans of having a magical day out. 
to Izuko right now. That was an unforgivable crime. Whatever do you mean? He asked with a knowing turn. She gently placed her bag down and got ready to put her hands up. I saw your video. Please. Having known when he was caught, gentle criminal removed his shades and mask and told his assistant. La brava, it's time to bring out the camera. You can't do this, she said with a trembling voice. There were no tears in her eyes yet, but all the excitement she'd been running on was turning into fury. He picked the wrong day to rile her up. I don't care what you have planned. I won't let you near my school. Well, aren't you a perceptive young lass? Gentle criminal didn't sound intimidated by her warning at all. Why would he? To him, she was just a child, a student. There weren't any hero agencies or even other adults around for her to call on for help. And if the cops found out there was any kind of threat around the school, then the festival was as good as cancelled. She had to handle this herself. But he wasn't going to listen to her, unless she thought of something else. From her experience, villains who weren't afraid of heroes dot 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 were only afraid of bigger and scarier villains. She adjusted her gloves. Hey, I know who she is. That's Izuko Midoriya, the kidnapped girl. La Brava, the assistant and videographer, alerted Gentle. Kidnapped girl. Gentle confirmed. You mean the one captured by that dastardly League of Vion? Before La Brava had a chance to get her camera rolling, Black Whip had both Gentle Criminal and La Brava in its grip. The thick tendrils wrapped around their bodies tightly and lifted them off their feet when they were caught off guard. She didn't intend to hurt them, just scare them. But she had to be convincing. Pull that villainous mask out once more, furry. Captured. She let out a sweet but sinister giggle. The one that made the League adore her, is that what you think? She squeezed them harder and they seemed to whimper in fright. It was working so far, but she still had to take it up a notch. She brought them closer to her so they could hear her sweet whispers. You didn't hear. I'm not the League's victim. She brushed her gloved fingers softly against her lips and cheek. I'm their queen. Now their whimpering turned into terrified squeals. They believed her just like that. It wasn't that much of a stretch after all. For a time, the time she'd grown so far from now, she was their queen. That label was forced on her. But if it was enough to scare other villains away, why shouldn't she use it to her advantage, especially if it was for a noble cause? Now that we've cleared that misunderstanding, I believe I told you to leave the school alone. Is that understood? Izuko raised them higher as she put her free hand on her hip. La Brava was shivering so badly. It alarmed Gentle. So he pushed through his fear and got the nerve to talk back to this so-called villain queen. We're not the dogs of the League of Villains. We do not answer to their master. When Izuko noticed the way he looked at his assistant, she realized that he really did care for La Brava, and it hurt him to see her in such distress. It almost made her feel bad for taking on the bigger fish role here in the villain food chain. But it was too late to back down, so she had to double down on the threat. I'm trying to handle this as nicely as possible. UA High School is already marked. It's the League of Villains property now. If any other villains show up and interfere with our territory. She carefully controlled the very tips of Black Whip to sharpen like small knives, where they stood pointed only a few inches away from their throats. Let's just say the king would be very displeased. I know you're not dangerous, gentle criminal. You're not even close to being a threat to us, but my king. He's very petty, especially with people who disrespect me. That shut them both right up. Hopefully it was enough. Because I like you, I'm giving you one more chance to leave. Make your little vlog somewhere else, or I'm calling my king. Izuko declared, smiling once more, so, do we have an agreement? Why why yes ma'am? La Brava squealed, too scared to even wiggle away from the sharp point near her face. Why you have my word? Gentle criminal also relented. Wonderful. Izuko giggled happily, bouncing in joy that it worked. She flashed one more scary glare from her large eyes, now get out of my sight. She used Black Whip to fling Gentle Criminal and La Brava further down the hill, in the opposite direction of UA. They disappeared over the horizon and out of her sight. Once they were gone, she shivered and grimaced as playing the villainous had left a bad taste in her mouth. She checked the clock on her phone. Still time to make it back to school before 9am. She took a few steps before she realized something. Oops, almost forgot my bag. Silly me. Izuko laughed as she grabbed her shopping bag from the sidewalk. Izuko ran up the hill, with her favorite red shoes grinding against the sidewalk as the plastic bag swished along her elbow. She had used up the last of her spare time and the rest of her day was completely booked. She had to make it back in time to change into her costume, get into position and carry on the show as planned. Then came the cleanup, and then she promised Mirio and Iri she'd spend the rest of the festival with them. And somehow, in between, she had to make that candy apple so she could surprise Iri with it before the end of the day. Her phone rang which interrupted her thought process. She kept running while she answered it with a very curt, Hello, Midoriya, I am here, but where are you? You're supposed to be with your class in the gym. All Might asked in great concern. I had to run an errand. It was really important. She explained quickly. And you didn't tell anybody. You almost had me worried. You can't just go running off like that. All Might started to scold her. I told Sato. 
Relax, Izuko snapped back, surprising herself with her tone. Sorry, didn't mean to shout. I'm on my way back right now, I'm just down the street. Be there in a few. She felt a bitter sting in her mouth when she hung up. She was still coming down from playing the villain just a few minutes ago, so she accidentally used the last of that venomous tongue on All Might. That's what scared her about pretending. Part of it came from the truth inside of her. Despite everything she'd done to free herself from the League's grip, her anger and pain still lingered, and not just at the League itself. Being with them for even a short time had opened her eyes to a lot of their justified gripes with the hero world they lived in. It also made her sad, because a lot of the members she met could have lived better lives if the right person had reached out at the right time. But she wasn't responsible for them anymore. She could no longer pretend to be their queen. Whether they were brainwashed by All for One, by Shigaraki, or even by Stain, she refused to sink down to their level. It had been a challenge to pull herself out, and she didn't do it alone. She had her friends, her mentors, and her family to support her along the way. They put her back on track to becoming the hero she needed to be. And maybe it wasn't too late for the League. Just as they left their mark on her, perhaps she left her mark on them. She didn't expect them to disband and surrender themselves anytime soon, but she hoped that they'd realize that saving one another was more fulfilling than killing others, especially after they lost one of their own. Finally, she made it back on campus and rushed to the gym changing rooms just a mere five minutes after nine o'clock. Everyone had their set outfits for the show. The dance crew had their bright yellow outfits and plastic garment protectors with their names written on them. The band had their own t-shirts made just for the concert. And the tech crew just needed comfortable and flexible clothes they could easily move around in. There you are. Where did you go? Achako asked. The store. It was an emergency. Izuko explained briefly as she opened her locker, expecting her athletic shorts and t-shirt to be waiting for her. But she found a garment bag with her own name instead. Wait, this is mine. Izuko asked. Yup, Ayama dropped it off for you. He said that he shouldn't be the only one twinkling up there. Suyu explained. Well that was nice of him, Izuko said, pulling the zipper down and expecting a yellow blazer and skirt to match the other girls in the dance squad. But what she got was an even bigger surprise. W wow, Izuko grasped her own cheeks in surprise. He wasn't kidding. Tene, M on the dot, and the gym was packed. Whether they came to genuinely enjoy themselves or out of spite, it felt like every UA student showed up to the concert. Miria was lucky to get a decent spot in the middle of the floor, holding Eri so that she could see above the crowd. When the house lights went down, all eyes turned to the stage. The show opened with a booming voice and a literal bang as an explosion hit the stage courtesy of the band's drummer, Bakugo. The stage light shone down on the dancers as the beat hit the ground running. The smoke ran across the floor. The band played against a giant screen playing colorful visuals, and the spotlight hit the lead singer, the one who made this whole show possible, Kayoka Jiru. When they first started planning for the festival, Jiru had a lot of reservations. She just couldn't see how her interest in music could combine with her dreams of being a hero. She thought she had to pick one and leave the other behind. But when her class hyped her up and encouraged her to lead their show for the cultural festival, she started to see things in a new light. Maybe she could help people with her music. When Izuko was taken away from them, everyone had fallen into despair. While Bakugo had thankfully gotten rescued quickly, Izuko was gone for weeks and it sometimes felt like she wouldn't come back. Even when they got her back, Jiru could see that Izuko wasn't the same. All the girls could see that. Izuko shared with them what she had been through, and it horrified them. It was amazing that she still even wanted to be a hero after that. But Izuko showed some of the most enthusiasm for this concert. Like she needed it to feel normal again. To feel joy again. So if this concert could help her dot 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 then it could help anyone. Thanks for coming out today. Jiru yelled to the crowd before starting to sing. Since Ayama and Izuko were coming straight from center stage, they actually got to dance for the first verse. Ayama wore his armor that was his hero costume, and Izuko wore what appeared to be the same yellow jacket and bubble skirt as the rest of the female dancers. Hey, there she is, and she told us she wouldn't be on stage. Mirio pointed her out as he held Iri in one arm. Guess she wanted to surprise us. As the band built up to the chorus, it was time for Izuko and Ayama to perform their show-stopping trick. Izuko threw him into the air with a spin as he fired off his dazzling lasers in short spurts so they sparkled like fireworks, much to the awe of the crowd. Then, she raised her arm in the air to shoot out Black Whip over the ceiling bar and wrap itself around Ayama. Now that they were connected, they grabbed each other's arms and spun around, with Ayama grabbing at Izuko's tearaway clothes to reveal her sparkling gold dress. The sweetheart bodice had halter straps behind her neck to keep it in place, and the double tears on the skirt twirled as they spun, eliciting more oohs from the audience. 
Black Whip twisted around as they wounded up tightly, and finally, right on beat, they ran and leaped into the crowd. The twisted black tendrils slowly unwound themselves, making Ayama and Izuko fly in circles like aerial dancers. The lights from his quirk were captured in the shiny sequins on her dress. They soared through the streamers and ice pillars that the rest of the tech team had so skillfully set up. Mirio was stunned as he watched Izuko fly through the air, and literally lost his breath. She looked so beautiful and more importantly, so happy. Izuko smiled so brightly as she glided over the crowd, and for the first time in a long time, they were smiling with her. Their captivated eyes followed her graceful movements above them, looking at the goddess that graced them with her presence. Everything had come together for this moment. The lights, the decorations, the music, the dancing, the energy. Everyone in the audience was wrapped in the euphoria of it all, including the guest of honor. The numbing despair that wrapped around her finally dissipated and she smiled for the first time and let out a happy squeal. Mario noticed immediately, and tears came to his eyes. Are you seeing this, Midoriya? Sir, she's smiling, and the answer was yes. Izuko did see it. As Black Whip swung back towards the stage, Izuko spotted Iri in the crowd and saw the cheerful smile on her face. That alone swept away Izuko's own cloud of doubts and fears. Tears flowed from her eyes, too. She didn't feel Shigaraki's hands anymore. She finally felt free. After what could only be considered a successful show, Mirio and Iri found Izuko during cleanup. Hey, there you are. You really got us on that one, telling us you weren't dancing. Mirio teased her as she ran up to them. Though as she approached, his smile weakened in awe. Now that he was seeing her dress up close, it struck him and made his heart beat in his ears. That was crazy. At first when there was a loud noise, it was scary. But then everyone was jumping with the dance and then there was a flash and then you and that guy were flying in the air. Iri recounted every exciting thing that she loved with the purest smile Izuko had ever seen. It hadn't left her face since she started. That's when it started to get cold and I saw birds, and you were with the spinning light, and a bunch of people said wow and you know what I said. Wow, too. It was so much fun. Izuko could barely contain her own joy. She wrapped her arms around Iri and picked her up in a spin. I'm glad you had such a good time, Iri. You don't know how much I needed to hear that. Around them. The rest of Class 1 was picking up the ice they made for the show and melting it in the disposal with the heat quirks. Oh, I'll catch up with you in a little bit. First we gotta finish cleaning up and then Izuko started. You're good, Midoriya. We got it from here. Go have fun. Mina assured her. She saw how Tagata and her acted around each other, and she wasn't going to let anything hinder that. You did great up there. You deserve it. Achako assured her as she floated chunks of ice that were too heavy to carry. Aw oh, thanks, you guys. Izuko smiled and waved at her caring friends. Then, she felt something fall on her shoulders. She looked and saw that Mirio had removed his varsity jacket and placed it on her. It's kind of chilly today, so you might want to bundle up, Mirio said with his kind eyes and cheeky smile. Uh, Izuko got so flustered she lost her words. She did stick her arms through the jacket to actually put it on, though, T thank you. I g guess it is a little cold, without the stage lights. Come on, Iri, there's even more fun to be had. What do you want to see next? Mirio asked Iri. Hem, I don't know, Iri said. Even when presented with the pamphlet, there are still so many options. We can just walk around if you want. Izuko took Iri's hand. And when you see something you like, just give us a shout, Mirio said, taking Iri's other hand. As they walked off to see the rest of the festival, both Mirio and Izuko raised their hands up to lift Iri and let her swing between them. She squealed with joy as she did so, so full of excitement and the childish innocence she long deserved. There was so much to offer that they really had to pick and choose wisely. There was a hero quiz bowl that Izuko completely dominated and an obstacle course that All Might held the fastest record for. She found that Kaken would spend nearly the whole day doing the course over and over again to try to beat it. He was nothing if not tenacious. Iri enjoyed all sorts of treats, but as Mirio noticed, there hadn't been a candy apple stand yet. Izuko didn't want to ruin the surprise, but she also had to sneak in the time to actually make it. She was originally going to say that she had to change out of her shimmering stage dress as an excuse to leave, but that backfired. No, leave it on. He insisted, it looks good on you. Uh, Izuko tried to keep her composure, you're so silly, Tagata. It's a little flashy for my tastes. Maybe flashy's good. It really compliments the shine in your eyes, Mirio said. He kept saying stuff like that. He always said flirty stuff to her. It was funny, right, that they were comfortable enough to joke like that. One of the biggest events that Mirio couldn't miss was the beauty pageant. Since Nejire was competing, he had to support one of his best friends. When it was her turn on the stage, she wore a light blue dress that made her look like a fairy princess, a look that complemented her quirk very well. She put on a show of sky dancing with her wave motions making the shape of a rose in the air. It was absolutely mesmerizing. Whoa dot 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 she looks so beautiful. Izuko commented with stars in her eyes. That's what it was like watching you on stage today. 
Mirio said. You know I mean it when I said you should enter the pageant next year. Come on, Tagata. You gotta stop saying stuff like that. Izuko said with a small giggle. Stuff like what? He asked. That stuff. Calling me beautiful and lending me your jacket and everything. It sounds like you actually want to go out with me. Izuko said. Because that is what I want. Stop. But it is. If you'll let me, that is. Mirio said, tucking his hands into his pockets. Iri stood between them, looking back and forth. She had assumed they were already together. After all, she always saw them together. She didn't remember much of her real mother and father, but that's what they felt like to her. Tagata. Izuko's heart fluttered as she said his name this time. How long had he felt this way? Just today. But something more important dot 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 how long had she wanted the same thing? She never felt so happy until today. Was this dot 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 was this what love was supposed to feel like? I, I'll be right back. Izuko stammered as she caught a glimpse of her watch and noticed the day was almost over. Wait, I'm sorry if that's not what you Mirio started to apologize already for what he thought was a rejection. No, it's not that. Sorry, my timing is terrible. I really will be right back, Izuko said, blushing hard as she ran off, looking back at them, and when I do, I have something to tell you. Stick a chopstick in the middle of the distemmed apple. Mix several scoops of sugar into a bowl of water. Pour into a pan and boil. Add red food dye. Mix. Coat the apple in the sugar mixture. Let it cool. These were the instructions that Izuko followed to a tea in order to make the perfect candy apple in one of the food stalls that Rikido Sato was helping watch over. It took a good 30 minutes, and she anxiously fanned the candy apple to cool it down as quickly as possible. Once the candy coating was perfectly crystallized, she rushed out to find Mirio and Uri again. The sun was setting, casting an orange glow over the students as they packed away their stands, basking in the afterglow of a successful festival. She heard from one of her classmates that Mirio took Iri towards the front because Aizawa called for them since it was almost time for Iri to go back to the hospital. That set Izuko's feet on fire. She held the candy apple on a stick behind her back as she ran for the entrance. Luckily, she caught up to them before the car had arrived. Hey, there you are. No, you didn't ditch us, Mirio said as soon as he spotted her. Of course I couldn't let her go without saying goodbye, Izuko said, panting with her hands still behind her back. She looked at Uri who was clearly tired from all the excitement of the day. Thanks for coming today. I loved it. Uri had her calm expression on her face and nodded. Izuko knew what was missing. So with a cheeky smile, she revealed the special treat. One more thing, got a surprise for you. A candy apple. From where? I couldn't find any. Mirio looked beyond shocked. Yeah, I didn't see that anyone was going to be selling them, so I bought ingredients when I went out this morning. It was easier to make than I thought it'd be. Izuko handed the candy apple to Uri who stared at it with dreamy eyes and salivating lips. The only thing I couldn't get at the store was food coloring, but Sato had plenty. It's getting late, but you two should be able to see her again soon. Aizawa told them. Both Izuko and Mirio watched intently as Iri took her first bite ever of a festival candy apple. The joy that erupted on her face as her eyes twinkled and she licked the sweet coating off her lips was exactly what they were hoping for. It's the best thing ever. Iri exclaimed in her cute little voice with her smile that could heal all wounds. Then I'll make them again. Izuko said, matching the delight on her face. So you'll have something to look forward to. Once the car arrived, Aizawa loaded Iri into the car seat and rode along next to her back to the hospital. Mirio and Izuko waved until the car disappeared down the hill. And then, it was just the two of them, alone under the glowing sunset. That was really sweet of you to make her that candy apple, Midoriya. Mirio praised her, truly the cherry on top of a perfect day. Yeah, and I'm sure she loved riding on your shoulders. You really are like a big brother to her. Izuko smiled at him. MHM, Mirio puffed his cheeks and shoved his hands in his pockets. I hope you had a great time, too. Yeah, I did. An amazing time actually. Izuko laughed. Kind of wish this day didn't have to end. Mirio looked like he had something to say. But he held back like it wasn't his place to bring it up, which was unusual for him. He awkwardly spun around like he was going to head back to his dorms. Then Izuko remembered. Just before she left to make the apple, Mirio had essentially confessed to her. He said that he wanted to go out with her, and all those compliments he gave her weren't just out of politeness. Tagata, I was going to tell you. Izuko clutched the skirt of her sparkling dress nervously. When I say you're like a big brother, I mean to Uri specifically. I don't think of you like a brother. So what do you think of me, Midoriya? Mirio asked honestly. His small eyes widened as he saw Izuko taking steps right towards him. She took a deep breath so she could give Mirio what she wanted to give him since the day they defeated Overhaul together. It took more effort on her part since she was much shorter than him, but as she stood on the tip of her toes, Mirio got the idea and met her halfway. Their lips puckered and met in a soft kiss. She reached up and hooked her arms around his neck to stay connected to him. When their lips parted, they immediately came back together again in a soft embrace. His strong but gentle arms picked her up at her waist and wrapped around her to pull her in even closer. 
This warmth was so soothing and made her feel protected. Their lips opened to breathe and then reunited once again while they were still parted. Izuko dug her tongue in first, becoming intoxicated by the taste of him. From everything he said to her, he sounded like he wanted this for a long time and he deserved it. But that wasn't why she was kissing him. Not just because he earned it, but because she wanted him, too. This brave hero who sacrificed everything just to make a girl smile. She wanted to feel him, to heal him, to love him, even if it was just for this moment. She was serious when she said she didn't want this beautiful day to end. Miriel let out a small chuckle as Izuko deepened their kiss. That was his jerk reaction to anything that surprised him. His laughter. It was so cute how he did that. And it was contagious, too. The bliss was infectious today. And Izuko was riding off this high like her life depended on it. She wanted more, so much more. Mirio broke out of the kiss only to whisper in her ear. Maybe we should take this somewhere more private. With excitement building in her, she smiled as she nodded intensely and grabbed his hand, pulling him along as she ran back towards the dorms. Though there was still the choice of whose dorm they would go to. Man, if I still had my quirk, I could sneak into your dorm room easy. Mirio commented as he kept up with Izuko's sprinting pace. But it looks like we gotta do this the old-fashioned way, sneaking me in through the balcony. No, let's not go to the one at dorm dot 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 let's go to your room instead. The teachers are less strict at the third year dorms, right? Izuko decided. Yeah, a little. But aren't you worried about people seeing you going into the third year dorms? Mirio asked. I don't care about that. Let them think whatever they want. Izuko brushed off the concern with a carefree smile. The danger that came with sneaking and made it all the more thrilling. The trick was to walk with purpose, like she belonged there. She stole a few more kisses on the way, on his lips, on his cheeks, and wherever else her lips landed when she jumped up. Once they made it to his dorm, they took quiet steps around the third years, making it to the elevator before anyone noticed. They got some quick alone time when the metal doors slid closed, and Mirio took his chance to corner her against the elevator walls, pressing his arms on each side of her. Her heart fluttered as she looked up to his naughty smile that was coming down to nibble on her ear. She covered her mouth to muffle her giggling at how much it tickled. The elevator ding gave them a warning to act natural before the doors opened and they could make the casual stroll to his room. Still, Izuko couldn't hide her giggles when Mirio fumbled with his door key. Finally, once the door opened, Mirio grabbed her arm and yanked her inside with him before shutting it quickly. She took a quick look at his cluttered room, glancing at the movie posters on his wall and stacks of books covering his desk. In the corner sat a small TV stand with a modest-sized television on top and a few gaming systems in the shelving. Welcome to Casa Tagata. Sorry if it's kinda messy, I would've cleaned up if I knew you were coming. Mirio said as he locked his door. No, that's okay. I like it. Izuko assured him. She put her hands on his shoulders and hopped on him, wrapping her legs around his hips tightly. He held her face as he kissed her, locking his lips around hers and exploring with his tongue. She came at him with such passion, and his burning desire had been waiting for this day. Her cheeks flushed as she sighed into his kiss. She ran her fingers over his soft blonde hair and pulled away to moan in his ear. Mirio. He clutched her thighs in his strong grip and groaned intensely as he marched towards his bed with her still hanging on him. He brushed off the shirts on his bedsheets in a strong swing and plopped her down with a bounce on his mattress. His goofy smiles were replaced with serious expressions of want. He growled and slowly crawled on the bed, covering her and breathing hot on her face like an animal. He pressed his forehead on her before he went any further. Tell me what you want, he said in a low whisper. Her skin shook in pleasurable chills and she slid down along his bedsheets. You, Mirielle. She said in a soft sigh. He moaned at hearing his name on her tongue, and kissed her once more, nibbling on her lip and licking down her neck and sliding his own jacket off of her so he could keep the trail going down her freckled shoulders. His lips felt like nice little stings on her skin. The scent of his sweat on his neck made her tremble with desire. Once his jacket was off her arms, she threw it to the floor. Mirio lowered himself to brush his face into her neck while his hands slid across her breasts over the shimmering fabric of her dress. Her arms twisted behind herself as she arched herself into his touch while also unzipping her dress. He took the honors of pulling it off while lifting her legs and butt just above the bed. There was no room for a bra under the dress, so her chest came out completely. She returned the favor by pulling his shirt off, and she got a look at his defined chest and abs that she missed out on seeing during the training lesson he did with her class. It sparked even more excitement in her, so she threw her hands forward to touch him, running her thumbs across the ridges of his muscles. The lights in his room were dimming as the sun disappeared outside, but she could still see enough to catch a glimpse of the scar on his right side. She gasped at the dark jagged pattern that spanned a few inches and then split into smaller branches, like a lightning bolt. The testament to his sacrifice. She gently caressed it with the tips of her fingers, causing Mirio to shudder quietly. Then, she placed a tender kiss on it, for she admired it more than anything else on his body. Izuko had her own scars that Mirio also revered. 
The surgical scars on her arms showed the consequences of trying to keep one for all under control. The power that he didn't even know he was competing for. He held her wrists close to him and kissed the dark lines on her hand. His breath quickened into panting when the last rays of light peeked through his curtains and shined onto Izuko's eyes. That alluring green that glowed intensely. Izuko, Mirio whimpered as he could barely contain himself. Sprawled out on his bed in just her panties, he gave thanks to behold the goddess before him. He wrapped his hands tightly on the curves of her waist and lowly groaned as he devoured her chest with rough licks and bites. His sudden fervor shocked her, but she welcomed it with pleasured gasps and affirming moans under her breath. She held onto the tight muscles of his biceps, losing herself in the bursts of pleasure. For the first time, she felt so relaxed during this. Her fear was gone. Mirio would never try to hurt her, and she knew that for a fact. She felt his hand travel down her stomach and slide her panties off her legs. He slowly started to insert his fingers and rub around vigorously. Eva, slow down. She squeaked as the sensation was overwhelming. Right, sorry. He quickly corrected himself and slowed his fingers, making small circles around the raised bump he felt inside. Her moaning was quiet, so he gently let his thumb glide over it to make her moan louder, better. And an MPH. Izuko couldn't express it in words, but she did muffle a loud moan behind bitten lips and squeezed his arms harder. With each stroke of his fingers, he felt her get wetter until her hole was nice and slick. He huffed with anticipation as he undid his belt and unbuttoned his pants. Izuko leaned up to help him pull them down and off. You know, I actually used to get undressed much faster with my quirk, Mirio mentioned as he reached over to open his drawer to pull out a fresh box of condoms. I know. Izuko laughed and pulled her knees up to her chest. Kirishima told me. He did. That's embarrassing. Mirio said as he opened the box and ripped open one of the small metallic packages. How do you think I feel? Izuko jested and bit her lip. My whole class got to see it before me. Ah, when you put it that way. Kinda stings. Mirio laughed with her. He slipped the condom over his cock which had been fully erect from the moment Izuko jumped on him. He was still in shock that this was happening. And he felt like he was in a dream. He looked over and she was still there, in the flesh with her eyes gazing over his whole body. She held one knee tightly as her breathing hitched. He carefully mounted her, touching the freckles on her soft cheek as he trapped her under his tall muscular form. As just one final reassurance, he asked, You sure you're good with this? Yeah, because it's you. She said softly. She parted her legs and watched him slip it inside her. She reveled in the whimper he made as he felt her heat. The fullness she felt made her feel powerful. His movements pushed against her sensitive flesh, sending flurries of pleasure that quieted her usually busy mind. This was what it was supposed to be. It should have always been this way. But she hadn't been so lucky. But today had already been so cathartic. She might as well tackle her biggest trauma head on. Because she was too consumed in today's joy with Mirio to even ponder on who came before. Mirio was a master of controlling his body's movements, which he really got to show off. He pushed his hips delicately at first, like he was merely caressing her from the inside. When Izuko grabbed his hips and tried to pull them closer, he could tell she wanted something more. So he thrust it harder, panting and moaning in her ear. MMM. M. Mirio. Izuko groaned as he hit the right spot, wrapping her legs around him. He reached for her hand, locking his fingers with hers and pressing it down into the mattress to anchor himself. His own euphoria was consuming him, making him sweat and shiver as he panted. Please don't stop. Please. Izuko pleaded in soft whispers. Her hips rocked against his and she held onto his back so tightly with her free hand, feeling the extent of his muscles there, too. Her legs felt numb, disappearing in the hot sensations that covered her whole body. She let out a loud moan that riled him up even further. Mirio let go of her hand just to grab her waist tightly and thrust even harder, which made her moan louder, too. He watched her body bounce under him, and her head roll back against the pillow. Such a beauty to behold, just as he always fantasized she would be. Then, her moans halted, like she was choking on them, and her whole body tensed and then went limp. Her eyes fluttered in exhausted pleasure, and Mirio leaned down to kiss her drooping eyelids. He moved on to kiss her nose and then back to her lips holding that kiss and moaning into it as he rolled his hips in her more. She pressed herself tightly against him, wrapping every limb around him and clinging to him. Her chest felt soft against his, and he lost himself to her tight warmth. He released everything that was pent up in a string of tense whimpers and groans, and finally collapsed on top of her. He wheezed like he lost all the air in his lungs when he rolled off of her. He rested his palm on his forehead as he tried to compose himself. She did him the favor of removing and discarding his condom. Watching his abs rise and fall with his tired breath, she got up to look for her phone to check the time. She had left it in the pocket of his jacket which was abandoned on the floor. It was getting pretty late. If she didn't leave now, she'd miss curfew. But as she looked back at Mirio, she thought she caught the sight of tears welling up in his eyes even as he hid them under his hand. She texted Yuraka, cover for me. I'm staying with a friend tonight. The curfew for the first year dorms was 10pm. 
Izuko was going to miss it. When Achako got the text, she was stunned that Izuko was suddenly spending the night somewhere else after being so cautious since she moved into the dorms. She trusted her friend but she still wanted to know where she was. Which friend? Achako texted back. The three dots that popped under her text seemed to go on forever, like Izuko was reluctant to say. Finally, the response popped up. A million. Achako gasped and dropped her phone on her pillow. She squealed into her palms which sent her afloat in her room. She'd noticed since the work studies how Tagata looked at Izuko, but Izuko never said anything about liking him back. But the way they walked through the school together whenever Iri was there, they just looked like the perfect little family. Achako was actually so happy that her friend was finally spending time with a guy as sweet and kind as she was. Achako always thought Izuko deserved better and she finally found better. So she wasn't going to let her get in trouble for it with the teachers. She went to the private class when a girls group chat and called for an emergency slumber party. Sleepovers were allowed in the dorms as long as they were the same gender. And the girls had sleepovers in each other's rooms all the time so Mr. Aizawa wouldn't find anything out of the ordinary. It also made the nightly head checks easier for him since he could count off multiple people in the same room. Within six seconds of Achako's text to the group, her phone was buzzing with responses of be right there. And Amwa, I've got popcorn. Mina was the first to burst into Achako's room. I'm brewing some tea as we speak. Momo came in shortly behind her. All the of the other girls made it as requested. And then finally Tsuyu asked, is Izuko coming? Funny thing about that. Achako said nervously before she closed and locked her door behind her. After Izuko relented and told Achako who she was with, she put the phone down on the drawers and returned to bed. Hey, what's wrong, Mirio? She asked as she saw him rub his eyes until the tears disappeared. I don't know. Nothing, really. Don't worry about it. Mirio tried to brush it off with a smile like he always did. But this time, he couldn't. You don't have to keep hiding like that. Izuko crawled into his lap and put her reassuring hands on his shoulders. I know. I know you miss him. You really missed out, Izuko. Mirio's eyes welled up all over again. He was always so harsh with you. You didn't get to see how much he really cared. He even said some really nice things about you before he died. I know. All Might told me, Izuko held his cheeks as his tears fell, and they dripped down between her fingers. Now she was the one who was smiling while he cried. She could see that he needed to cry, so it made her glad that he was allowing himself this, and in front of her. And you really would have made him proud today. You made a lot of people smile, and when Uri was smiling, I really was really hoping he could see it. Mirio spilled his heart out as Izuko wrapped herself around him. Maybe he did. He could see the future after all. Izuko said, Haha dot 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 that's what I wished, too. Mirio said as he sniffled, but I still don't know how I'm going to do this without him. He taught me so much, but I still feel like we had only just started my training. And I know I'm supposed to be more than my quirk, but I still feel like losing it means I wasted all of that training. When it came to Mirio's lost quirk, Izuko didn't have assuring words for that. She knew that all of his friends and loved ones would have already told him that he was still the same hero without it, but she could tell he wasn't telling her this to hear that again. She also held on to her own secret for a long time. But now, it felt like the time to share it, since she'd already shared everything else. Nirio, I'm not supposed to tell people this, but, as Yuko held his hands in hers, I was born quirkless. W what? Come on, you're not just saying that to make me feel better, are you? Mirio asked. No, I mean it. Until I started high school, I didn't have a quirk, but, I still wanted to be a hero. I wanted to make people smile the way All Might does dot 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 the way you do. But without a quirk, there wasn't a chance of that happening, until... I met All Might, Izuko confessed. If anyone deserved to know, it was him. Yeah dot 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 your All Might's successor. That's what Sir said before he died. I didn't know what he meant by that, so I figured it was something between them. Nirio said, I guess he didn't tell you. It's a pretty big secret. Izuko looked at her own hand. All Might saw me try to save my boyfriend's life from a villain even though I was quirkless. And then he chose me dot 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 to take on his quirk as his successor. He actually became a teacher here to find a successor. And if he hadn't found me, then Sir Knight I would have pushed for you to be his successor. Mirio did seem stunned, but not as shocked as Izuko thought he would be. Did Sir Knight I tell you anything about that? Izuko asked. Not really, though he did seem pretty cryptic when he would talk about his goals for me. He did talk about me becoming the next symbol of peace like All Might. But I thought that was just a figure of speech. Mirio answered. That's actually why Sir Knight I and I didn't get along so well at first, like you said. He thought that I stole that spot from you. I can see why he wanted you, though. You make everyone smile wherever you go, and you're amazingly strong. In some ways, you're just like All Might, as Yuko said. So that's really how you got your quirk. All Might gave it to you. Mirio couldn't just gloss over that part. I didn't know quirks could do that. Not all quirks, just his. One for all. Izuko spilled the big secret. She chose Mirio. It's been passed down through generations. With each new holder, it gets stronger. 
I'm still trying to get it under control, but I'm working every day to make it my own. Whoa, that's so cool. Mirio was so excited with the revelation, it took him out of his own pain for a moment. Then, he got a glimpse of the clock and saw it was way past curfew. Oh crap, it's that late. You should get back to your dorms before your teacher finds out you're not in your room. No need, I've got it covered already. Hizuko checked her phone and saw a thumbs up from Machako. She set it back down and rested herself on Mirio's big muscled chest. I want to stay here with you. Are you sure? Mirio asked. Is something wrong with that? If you want me to go, I can go. Hizuko offered, starting to slide off. No, stay, please. He suddenly begged and pulled her back to where she was, but then hesitated and rubbed his neck. I mean, I want you to, but I've been getting night terrors lately. I wouldn't want to scare you in the middle of the night. No, I don't mind. Hizuko scooted herself up and kissed him. I'll be here for you if you need me. Over at the wanted dorms, Achako's emergency sleepover had been a success. When Mr. Aizawa popped his head in to do the checks, he counted seven different sleeping bags, all stuffed and moving, some were even snoring. Once he was satisfied, he closed the door and continued on to count the boys for the night. As soon as he was gone, the girls giggled and pulled the breathing simulator that Momo created out from the All Might sleeping bag that supposedly contained Izuko. It was the same gadget that was inside those sleeping kitty toys, but Momo made it big enough to make the whole sleeping bag move like a person was breathing inside it. Once Achako told them where Izuko was, every girl did their part to let their friend get her knight in shining armor. In the darkness of the room, Izuko was comfortably nestled in Mirio's chest under his blanket. They were drifting off to sleep, but not completely there yet. Hey, Mirio mumbled. M.M., you said All Might saw you save your boyfriend, right? Is there someone I should be worried about? No, we broke up months ago. Izuko assured him as she yawned. Am I your boyfriend now? Mirio asked. I don't know, Izuko muttered. This all kinda happened so fast. S okay. Mirio slurred as he drifted off. You don't have to call me that if you don't wanna. I'm just glad this happened at all. S a dream dot 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 come true. Even after they slept together, the little things he said like that still made her blush. She curled her fingers around his arm before she finally fell asleep. Izuko may have been able to evade the curfew, but she couldn't avoid missing breakfast at the dorms. She had to get back before everyone woke up, so the light of dawn peeking through Mirio's window made her open her eyes. Achako texted her that the cover was that they were all having a sleepover at her dorm, so she knew to sneak in through Achako's balcony instead of her own. She could feel Mirio's body shift under her own with his slow sleeping breath. He looked so beautiful and at peace when he was sleeping. He warned her about night terrors, but they must have taken a night off since she didn't wake up to any sounds of distress from him. She carefully pried herself off of his chest and rolled off the bed to collect her clothes from the floor. As she redressed herself, she thought about the last things he muttered before they went to bed. Mirio was truly kind. Even after they had sex, he said that she didn't have to call him her boyfriend if she didn't want to. Truly, she knew that she had a great love for him. It took until yesterday to realize it, but it had been there for a while. From the day he sacrificed everything to save Eri. Naturally, if she loved him, she should want him as her boyfriend. But dot 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 that wasn't something Azuko was ready to say again. Her past relationships had weakened her instead of strengthened her. And now the title of boyfriend and girlfriend felt like terrible burdens. She didn't want to tie up Mirio with her needs and her struggles. Not when he was going through so much on his own. Yes, she had bared to him the secret of one for all, but that was something he should have been told anyway, since he was in the running for it. She hadn't even revealed the biggest part of it, the inevitable battle against evil incarnate. Yesterday had been a perfect day, with the perfect happy ending, but that day was over. Today, they had to go back to their real lives, where their journeys weren't even close to finished. If they met on the same path again, she'd love him as much as she did now, maybe more. Maybe then, she'd be ready to tie herself to him. But today, she had to let him go. Goodbye, Lemillion. She whispered and kissed his cheek before stepping out onto his balcony. With one for all activated, she jumped off the railing and hopped towards her own dorms before anyone had left their beds. December wow, pro-level work mere minutes after earning provisional licenses. This morning, we welcomed three students from UA. Young heroes who recently took down some rampaging villains, Tenya Ida, Katsuki Bakugo, and Azuko Midori. What a pleasure it is to have you join us. The young reporter announced for the news cameras as she interviewed the three students on the couch of their dorms. Ida sat politely but stiffly on one side. Bakugo slouched on the other and Izuko sat right in the middle with her big eyes and smile prepared for the camera. It had taken a lot of hours for her to prepare for any kind of media, but now she was ready. It's a pleasure to speak to you, too. Izuko bowed her head politely. You three must have a special connection to have worked so well together, huh? She asked. Does it look that way to you? You better get your eyes and head checked out soon, then, Bakugo said roughly. Cameras had been sniffing around him since the day of the sludge incident, back when he and Izuko were still together. 
then again when he was kidnapped by the League of Villains, but that was quickly squashed by Azuko's own kidnapping. He did not like this part of the job, not even a little bit. They knew what he did. Why did they need his opinion on it? He knew Izuko couldn't possibly enjoy this either, but she was better at hiding it. She had to be, because the media sharks were out for her blood way more. Yes, we've trained hard together under the same teacher so that helps us work well together when doing real hero work. Ada gave a solid answer in his usual serious tone. His famous family had been doing interviews for years. So even if Ada didn't always say the right things socially among classmates, he knew what to say to the cameras. And as we all know, this isn't your first encounter with villains, especially for you two, young Miss Midoriya and Mr. Bakugo. The reporter was rushing to point out the elephant in the room sooner than Izuko expected. She thought she would wait at least until the end. But it was all right, she prepared for this. The reporter lady continued, You two first made headlines over a year ago when you were rescued from a villain by All Might. And then again when you were each kidnapped separately by the group known as the League of Villains. Tell me, do you ever feel like trouble follows you wherever you go? As hero students, we're targeted by villains because we are the future of hero society, so that much is not a surprise. And maybe my classmates feel differently. But as I continue through my education, after all of these things that have happened, I feel as if they happen for a reason. These obstacles are being thrown our way not because we are cursed, but because we are being tested. But as you can see, we have overcome them and become stronger through them. As Yuko stated, and we're not the only ones. I imagine a lot of people out there are having struggles right now that they didn't feel before. And by before, you mean, before All Might's retirement, correct? The reporter clarified. Yes, but even though he retired, All Might was also there on the scene and still rescued as many people as he could, because being a hero isn't just his occupation, it's who he is as a person. Izuko smiled, but his retirement did make a lot of people lose their sense of security. But that's why my classmates and I are working so hard to be heroes in our own rights, not just to fill the void that he left behind but because we want to be the heroes that our changing society needs. My my, such assuring words, Miss Midoriya. Truly inspiring to see you blossom in adversity. The reporter commented, Thank you. Izuko bowed her head modestly, but I couldn't have done so without all of my friends, including the friends sitting beside me right now. Bakugo's face fell into a frown. She couldn't possibly be talking about him, could he? But he looked at her and saw her give him a smile and a nod, assuring him that she meant it. She also gave Ida a smile, which made him blush and take a sharp breath in. The Izuko they knew and loved was back in full force. A few days later, Christmas arrived and the class threw a party in the dorms. Everyone wore green or red Santa suits with personalized pom-poms dangling from their hats. Izuko donned a green Santa dress with a fluffy green pom-pom on her hat. Bakugo refused to wear one, but that didn't stop Denki from trying to throw one on him. There was an abundance of food and decorations, and presents piled up for the string game. Work studies are back in action. I'm so pumped. We must be the busiest first years in UA history, Kirishima said in excitement. I heard they're letting everyone do work studies, even if we didn't pass the license exam. Rikido Sato added, We probably just won't get to do as much though like with our internships. Are the two of you going back to join Rukyu? Jiru asked Achako and Su. Yup, sure are. Achako answered, What about you, Izuko? Are you going back to the Night Eye Agency? Well, I wanted to. But Sentupter is the one running it now and he said that they're too busy right now to take on any students. I can't say I blame them. I'm sure it's been hard for them without Sir Nighteye. And Gran Torino's been busy, too, so I can't go back to him, either. Izuko said. Damn, that really sucks. Kirishima said. But I'm not worried. Since they're mandatory this time, I'm sure the school will find a place for me. Izuko smiled. What about you, Bekugo? Are you going back to the best genist agency? Kirishima asked. That was a harder question than he realized. Best Genist had suffered the loss of one of his lungs during the fight in Kamino Ward, so he had been in recovery for a long time, and now he disappeared altogether. Bakugo could still work under his sidekicks, but he wanted to work with the man himself. He still had to tell him his new hero name, after all. I haven't decided yet. Bakugo answered. Once the turkey was served, the door opened with the one who would become the life of the party. Sorry we're late. Have you started the party already? Aizawa said as he came through the door with the guest of honor. Iri walked in wearing her own little red Santa suit and hat, which lit up the whole room. I'm supposed to say, trick or treat? Iri asked, unsure of how to celebrate the holidays she had only recently learned about. Not quite. Wrong holiday. Aizawa gently corrected her as he kneeled down to her level. Iri Klaus. Everyone gushed. Izuko was in tears over how cute she was. So cute. Achako ran to get a closer look. You look amazing. Izuko patted her eyes down to compose herself. Fortune in, demons out. Iri threw some beans on the carpet, trying to do the right custom. No, you're even further away now. Aizawa told her. Hey, is Tagata coming? That guy's a riot. 
Hiroshima asked. Oh he's a riot, all right. Right, Izuko. Mina snickered as she elbowed Izuko in the shoulder. Kazuko's whole face turned beet red. SSHH. Jiru shushed Mina. Mina had squeezed Izuko for information as soon as she arrived back at her dorm that morning after the festival. If they were going to cover for her staying out past curfew, they needed to know it was for a good reason. Mirio Tagata was more than a good enough reason. Since Izuko agreed to share her story to them, the girls swore in turn to keep that secret. Still, Mina couldn't help but say a little something whenever someone brought him up. I'm afraid he'll be celebrating with his own class tonight. Aizawa told them before telling Yuri, enjoy yourself, go on. Izuko was a little dejected to hear that Mirio wouldn't be joining them, but she was quickly cheered up by Yuri handing her some hand-painted eggs. She didn't care if they were for Easter, today they were Christmas eggs. She stuck by Yuri's side for the whole party, showing her the best treats that the buffet had to offer and helping her with the present string pull. Surprisingly, Yuri had won the large sword that Takoyami had brought for the game. They offered to let her trade for something else, but Iri insisted on keeping the sword. Izuko sent a picture of Iri in her suit with her sword to Mirio to preserve the moment. There was also music provided by Jiru, who played rock covers of classic Christmas songs for all of them to enjoy. Everyone was smiling and laughing, and with so much joy in the air, it made Izuko feel grateful to be here for it, and she wished that they'd all be able to have a good Christmas next year as well. Once the party ended, it was time to clean up. They needed to pull down the decorations, scrub the floors and tables, and wash the countless dirty dishes they had racked up. They also still had their work studies on their minds. As Izuko and Bakugo stacked the dirty dishes from the table, Todoroki called out to them. Midoriya, Bakugo, if you don't have choices you like for your work studies. I was thinking. Todoroki cocked his head to the side. Why don't you come do a work study with me? With Endeavor. Why should we? Bakugo was about to question Todoroki on it but he was interrupted by the loud crashing of a glass plate hitting the floor. Izuko stood with shaking hands and the shards piled around her feet. Midoriya, are you alright? Did you hurt yourself? Todoroki asked, setting down his own plates to come to her aid. But she took a step away from him. May, work with Endeavor. Izuko verbalized it, but the idea sounded as preposterous out loud as it did in her head. After everything she learned about him, things that Shoto himself had told her, how could he ask her to work with that man? She stuttered, Be but I thought you hated him. I still don't like him, and you don't have to either, even if he did rescue you. But he's still the number one hero, so there's still something to learn from Shoto tried to convince her, but Izuko was already walking away without looking at either of them. I'm sorry about the plate. I'll get a broom and sweep it up right away, Izuko said as she quickly left for the supply closet. Even when she found the broom and dustpan, she still took a minute to herself to catch her panting breath. She didn't want to be angry with Shoto, but it was just so frustrating. Why tell her about how horrible of a person Endeavor was if he was just going to work for him anyway? If he wanted to forgive him and fix their relationship, that was fine. That wasn't her business, anyway. But he just asked her so casually to join him, as if nothing was wrong. Endeavor was not a good man. Why would she want to learn from his example? And then there was the part that wasn't Shoto's doing at all. Izuko had been holding on to Dabai's secret this whole time because she wanted to find the right moment to tell him. But if she was working under Endeavor... That would make this feeling worse. She'd be keeping the secret from both her good friend and her boss. Seeing how Endeavor treated Shoto, Izuko didn't think he deserved to know the truth about Dabai. But was that really her call to make? The longer Dabai kept his identity hidden, the more of an upper hand he'd have on Endeavor and Shoto. When she was with the League, she wished for Endeavor's downfall. She wanted the truth to come to light and the disgrace to end the charade of his goodness. But that kind of revenge, as justified as it felt, might hurt other people as collateral. And if she allowed anyone else to get hurt just to watch Endeavor suffer dot 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 then she wasn't very heroic after all. She pulled the broom and dustpan out of the closet and returned to the spot where she dropped the plate. The time to tell Shoto the truth was coming. But if she wanted to do it right, she needed to be closer to him. She should also be close to Endeavor as well, since she needed to explain to them in detail what she knew and how she knew it. After all, there was still a chance it was all a trick. Even though Dabai all but confessed to being a Todoroki, she didn't have any proof on her. He could have also been lying to make her feel like she was getting somewhere. So maybe there was value to working with Endeavor after all. Even if it was just to confirm her suspicions and lift this weight off her shoulders. I found the broom. It was hiding from me. Izuko smiled as she brushed the broken glass into the dustpan. Sorry, I can't help but feel that I upset you, Midoriya. Todoroki apologized as he helped her by picking up the rest of her plates. It's not your fault, Todoroki, Izuko said. And yes, I want to come to Endeavor's agency with you. After a nice winter break with her mother in the staff dorms, Izuko was anxious to begin her new work study with Shoto and Kaken at the Endeavor Agency. As a hero, Endeavor had recently earned Hero Society's respect when he defeated a large Namu that was stronger and smarter than any Namu they'd seen before. 
They took everything Endeavor had, but he only won by a hair, and he was left with a large scar running down the left side of his face. The fight had been broadcast on live TV, and when it was happening, Izuko could only watch and tend to Shoto while he stood helplessly in a catatonic state. Even if he truly hated his father, he didn't want to watch him die on TV, but she knew who would enjoy that. The Namu attack had the league stench all over it, but she hadn't seen a Namu that powerful while she was with them. They must have finally met up with the doctor that Shigaraki mentioned. They were growing stronger by the day, and Izuko knew she had to catch up to them. Hopefully, the pro heroes were getting stronger, too. She stepped off the bus and walked by Todoroki's side as he led her and Kakin towards his father's agency. They quickly recognized the large hulking man standing at the bus station to greet them. Welcome, I'm Endeavor. He greeted them with a polite smile. Before dropping to his usual scowl, is that the warm reception you were hoping for? I'm not thrilled to be taking the two of you on. I'm only doing this because Shoto asked. I was hoping it would only be Shoto and me. You already agreed to do it, so don't complain. Shoto snapped back. Shoto, Endeavor started to reprimand him. I've been thinking about this since the remedial course. You're a jerk, Kakin added. Izuko gave a small humored huff. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Son, are you really friends with this delinquent? Endeavor asked, clearly upset by being so disrespected. But if I can see how the top hero works, I don't really care. Kakin finished. I told you to choose your allies more wisely. Endeavor said to Shoto. Izuko had to admit, Kakin had a point here. It was part of the reason she agreed to this placement. Good or bad, Endeavor was the top-ranked hero for a reason. Even if she didn't condone his character, she had to learn what she could so that she could stand a chance against Shigaraki when she would inevitably see him again. Also, the way he looked now was different from what she'd seen at the sports festival. He looked like he was changing himself, trying to be better now that he was the official top hero. That's exactly what Dabai wanted, to watch him rise higher so he could kick the pedestal from under him. But when she looked at Endeavor, face to face, her mouth couldn't move. His intimidating glare stunned her silent. Before they actually made it back to the agency, they were quickly swept up into a mission. Or rather, Endeavor was on it, and his new students just had to stay behind him and help the citizens around him. They also got to meet Hawks, who flew past them as he joined the fight against Star Servant, a strange villain who manipulated glass and cried out odd apocalyptic messages. Even though Hawks was the number two hero, he was much different from Endeavor. Besides being much younger, he always had a cool smile on his lips and went with the flow. After Star Servant was quickly defeated, Hawks stopped to chat with them. It was nice to meet another big pro, especially the one who taught Takoyami how to fly. In class, Takoyami always talked about Hawks as a reckless mentor but Izuko could tell that he actually respected him very much. What was strange was when Hawks handed Endeavor a book about the Metal Liberation War and mentioned how it was becoming popular after an attack in Deka which destroyed the city. The gossip was that the fighting could only be stopped by unlicensed citizens using their quirks to fight back against the terrorists who got the upper hand on the heroes. Hawks also gave copies to Endeavor's students as well, as he was hiding multiple books under his jacket. Izuko took her suspiciously. Hawks dot 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 he was an odd hero. He acted so carefree. But Izuko could feel that he was hiding something, and she wanted to know what it was. She shook her head. Everyone had their secrets. If she tried to follow every strand her curiosity led her to, she'd get so tangled up that she'd go mad. She tucked the book into her bag to save for another time. Right now, she had to focus on Endeavor. If she didn't tell him about Dabai soon, the consequences could be dire. Endeavor's ambition wasn't the only thing on the line now. The rest of their society was counting on him, including his fellow pro heroes. Once they finally made it to the agency. Their work study could officially begin. I'll be supervising you all myself, Endeavor said, which surprised them, since Izuko and Bekugo thought they'd be left to train with one of his sidekicks. But before start, you gotta tell me about yourselves. Tell me why you're here today. There was silence for a moment before Bakugo decided to go first. I came to figure out what I can't do. My explosion can pull off anything I want it to. I've only got the one quirk, and it's the strongest, but I learned that a strong quirk's not enough to make me the strongest guy around. To surpass number one, I came to find out what I'm missing. Sure, Endeavor nodded before looking right at Izuko. You, Izuko Midoriya, you haven't said a word today, and were acquainted enough for me to know that that's unlike you. Although, last time we met, it was under extreme duress, so I don't blame you if you don't remember any of I remember all of it. Izuko said, brushing her hand over her cheek. I forgive you for handling me so roughly, by the way. Like you said, extreme duress. Endeavor looked at her curiously, confused by her almost coy response. But I didn't say anything because I was waiting for the right time. Izuko put her hands to her side and bowed respectfully, to thank you for rescuing me. If it hadn't been for you, I'd still be trapped with that horrible man, Shigaraki. 
If you hadn't saved me, he could have kept me prisoner for the next 10 or 20 years, using my body, my quirk, for his own selfish goals. But you're the number one hero, so I know there's no way you'd have allowed that to happen. Izuko rolled her head back up and looked up at Endeavor with sharp eyes. I know you're all super busy, so thanks for coming. I'm Shoto's sister, Fayumi. It's great to meet both of you, and thanks for looking out for him. Shoto's adorable and sweet older sister greeted them as they walked through the entrance of the Todoroki estate. She seemed especially excited to meet Izuko, since she grabbed her hand for a shake. I've heard so much about you, Izuko. Shoto only ever has good things to say about you. Thank you so much for being his friend. Fayumi said softly, like she was welcoming home a family member. Is Natsuo home? I saw his shoes. Shoto asked. Yes, the whole family wants to hear about how you three are doing. Fayumi said happily. It was her idea to invite them all over for dinner after their first day of work studies. Shoto had mentioned that his older sister was a school teacher, and his older brother was in college, but he hadn't gone into detail about their personalities. Maybe that was because Shoto hardly knew them himself. He told her that his father had tried to raise him away from his siblings, but the way that his sister greeted them made her stomach churn with discomfort. She seemed so cheerful and nice. How could Izuko just crush that with what she had to tell them? Maybe she had gotten it wrong. Maybe Damai wasn't his brother, but a distant relative, or the child of another woman, raised in someone else's household. And then, there was the chance they already knew who Damai was and kept it a secret to keep up appearances. Then, Izuko would be doing nothing but embarrassing them by bringing it up. As they sat around the traditional Japanese dinner table, Izuko was treated to one of the tastiest home-cooked meals she'd ever had that wasn't cooked by her own mother. If there's anything you can't eat, please let me know. Fayumi said as she clasped her hands as she catered to her family before sitting down herself. No, it's all fantastic, really? Izuko said as she dove into the food. It was all very rich and flavorful, and helped ease her stressed stomach. It makes sense. Fayumi's been doing the cooking ever since our cook retired due to back problems, Matsuo said with a grimace. He was a tall and bulky young man with white hair. Endeavor's physical genes were prominent in him. Matsuo used to cook, too. We took turns, Fayumi said. Huh, I used to eat your cooking. Shoto asked in surprise. Though Natsuo was his older brother, they spoke like acquaintances just getting to know each other. That, sadly, was more in line with Izuko's expectations of Todoroki's life at home. Maybe, maybe not. But my stuff's probably too rich, so. Endeavor probably didn't let you eat it, Natsuo said with obvious disdain. His tone made the whole table go quiet. His glare at Endeavor said it all. Izuko's stomachache returned. Fayumi tried to lighten the mood with more chit-chat, but Natsuo was already done. He harshly stood up from the table. The food was great, thanks. I sat at the table. That's enough, right? Natsuo scoffed, like he had painfully fulfilled his end of a bargain. Natsu, Fayumi pleaded with him. Sorry, sis, this is just too much. Natsuo said as he stormed off and slammed the sliding door behind him. The tension was so thick, it wrapped itself around Izuko's neck. Fayumi had tried her best to make their home appear warm and happy. But even her excellent cooking couldn't hide how broken this household was. But Izuko already knew that. What she didn't know was how Dabai fit into it. After everyone finished their meals, it was time to clean up. Even the guests helped take the dirty dishes to the kitchen. Izuko was rinsing her plate in the sink when she caught Endeavor taking a plate of leftover tofu down the hallway. Was he still hungry and going to eat it in his office? Izuko had a gut feeling that she should tag along quietly. She set her plate down and snuck a glimpse of Endeavor going down the hallway, going into a private room and shutting it behind him. She walked by the door, but he had been careful to shut it completely so she couldn't sneak a peek. When she heard him walking back, she scurried to the other hallway, but she had moved a little too quickly. Why are you running? Are you looking for the bathroom? Endeavor asked as he emerged from the room, the plate no longer in his hands. Why yeah? Izuko muttered, looking away from his gaze. Down this way to the left. Second door. Endeavor pointed her in the right direction. Thank you. She nodded and went the way he was pointing. But, once he left, she looked back at the room. She looked both ways before carefully sliding the door just enough to slip inside. It was dark, so she left the door open to let the light in. It was a simple bedroom that appeared to belong to a little boy. The shelving had stacks of books and toys that were covered in dust. But she found the plate of food in front of the cabinet, which she discovered was actually a shrine. She slowly approached the small altar and could smell the freshly burned incense. There were tiers of flowers around the plate of tofu. And finally, she spotted the framed photo. She saw the boy's soft face, his pointed chin, and most importantly, his striking eyes. His hair was white when this photo was taken, middle school as she could tell from the uniform. But Izuko recognized him instantly. She covered her mouth with her palms to muffle her sharp gasps. She found the proof she needed. This boy dot 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 was Dabai. No wonder Shoto never talked about him. He didn't recognize him, and never expected to. 
because everyone thought he was dead. Tears erupted in Izuko's eyes. The shrine was taken care of, which means that someone had loved him. Someone missed him. Todoroki. Izuko whimpered as she wept for him, for their whole family. Shoto had already been through so much. His father put him through hell. His mother had hurt him and then was sent away. And on top of all that, the family was mourning a son who wasn't even resting in heaven. Did Dabai know? Did he know that he was mourned? Did he think his family had abandoned him? Or was he dot 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 was he going to use their pain to fuel his revenge? Izuko. Shoto called her name as he opened the door completely and turned on the light. Who let you in here? I I. Izuko stammered, still crying. What's wrong? Did someone hurt you? Shoto rushed over to her. Did Endeavor know? No. Izuko bawled. It's me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. If I had known, I would have told you sooner. Her hysterics quickly summoned the rest of the household to the room. Even Natsuo, who had been waiting for his ride outside, came rushing back in when he heard the commotion. Like Shoto, he assumed Endeavor did or said something to their guest, which would be a new low for him. What's wrong, dear? Please, tell us, Fayumi said, wrapping a supportive arm around Izuko's shoulder. Bakugo stood by the door frame, unfazed. Sometimes Izuko cried over every little thing, so he waited to hear the reason before giving a real reaction. I'm sorry, you all have been hurting for so long, and I don't know what you're going to say, and I don't know how to say this. Izuko sniffled, trying to spit it out. Just as Endeavor came in through the door, she finally said it. Your brother is alive. 